Oh, you've got that thing. Oh, okay. doesn't seem to work. Is it working? No, it's not working. Okay, it's nine, so we, we, may, we may start. Uh, good morning, I'm Miguel Gonzalez, <coughs> I work at DILL, and it's a pleasure and an honor for me to chair the, the last session of this workshop. So our first speaker is uh, Joel Sals from Stony Brook, who is going to tell us about, well, a big picture from future spatial data sets, I don't know what it is, but you will tell us. Okay, well thanks, and uh, it's been really a, a fun workshop and I appreciate Tony and, and the group uh, inviting me. Uh, it's 
uh, quite enlightening to see the uh, thematic overlaps between uh, uh, various people uh, working in the large-scale facilities and some of the work that um, people in uh, my community have been doing. So and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, who my community uh, is. So, so, I so I started out, when Tony asked me to give, give a talk here, uh, I figured that I would give a talk describing some of the themes that we are uh, running into having to do with the uh, tremendous issue associated with training, um, training uh, AI deep learning algorithms that involve extremely large data sets. And I am going to talk about that, one of the, but one of the things that struck me is uh, pretty much everybody else obviously is having the same problem and the methods uh, that we've developed uh, and published on are, have tremendous overlap with a lot of the other things that have been discussed. So the talk is going to sort of be in two parts. Uh, the first part, I'm going to talk about my application domain, which uh, may be of interest and will motivate the second part of my uh, my talk. So, so I'm going to start out uh, with a quiz, uh, uh, which is uh, the question of the relationship between AI and the ratio between the diameter of a red blood cell and the height of a giraffe. So that's a little bit something. And I shouldn't ask people that because it's so obvious. Uh, but because everybody knows, I'll just move on to the answer. Uh, and that is, the, that, that, that's the same ratio as the speed of the top 500 computer uh, um, 25 years ago, which actually uh, uh, my group programmed. Uh, and as far as I know, the current leader, uh, which is Summit, uh, as in this year, which we actually just won an Insight, uh, a DOE Insight Award uh, on. So, so it's a factor of a million, which is, you know, I mean, you know, we're sort of used to factors of a million as being scientists, but actually in the real world, uh, it's quite a large number. And it really does um, do a lot, I think, and I think as many people here you know, realize, to explain, uh, at least in, in large part, the tremendous success of these more general AI algorithms, deep learning type algorithms, convolutional neural nets, versus the more uh, beautifully mathematically uh, crafted uh, algorithms uh, that have preceded it and that still continue. And there, of course, have been some really fantastic talks in the last couple of days linking these, which is, which is very, very exciting. OK, so I'm going to talk first about artificial intelligence and pathology, uh, a topic that most people here would have probably never thought about much you know, one way uh, or, or, or the other. OK, so, um, so what is one trying to do in artificial intelligence and pathology and, in fact, uh, what's the whole deal with this? Okay, so somebody comes in and they are being, you know, they have a lump, there's, there's a screening, there's some concern that they might have cancer, because usually it involves cancer, but not, not always. Uh, and a biopsy is taken and the uh, physicians look under a microscope and see these mysterious things and say it's a FUBAR of type 3. And whether a FUBAR of type 3 is good or bad news, people are happy or unhappy, and, and, it, and it really plays a major role in dictating uh, the treatment uh, that the patients undergo. Because you're actually looking at the tumor, the actual tumor uh, of, of the patient. And as I'll talk about, the old style pathology, as of a few years ago, this is what happened. And basically, a pathologist would write or dictate a report saying it's FUBAR type 3 and the world would go on. Now what you can do is take the uh, roughly couple centimeters square uh, plus minus uh, slices of tissue, uh, image them, segment all the cells, classify all the cells, classify all the structures. I mean, it becomes essentially, given that you're talking um, you know, <laughs> roughly um, 100 million plus minus uh, uh, new cancer patients in the world uh, each year, a, a tremendous huge data problem to actually come to grips with this new ability to actually find out what the heck is going on with cancer patients and to use this, use this clinically. So, so what, are, what are the tasks? Um, these are just a couple of the tasks, but at a high level, one is to classify and FUBAR type 3 versus FUBAR type 2. Okay, if you guys are, if, you, if you're a bunch of pathologists and you, you look and, and you say subjectively it's FUBAR type 2, the, the, the patient doesn't get surgery. 
And if you guys say FUBAR type 3, the patient does get surgery. And nobody would say FUBAR type 4 except that, that fellow would say FUBAR type 4. Because, so a lot of it is really quite, uh, quite subjective. And as I'll tell you, I mean, there's actually really good data you know, for that. So treatments of patients uh, become you know, somewhat randomized and not necessarily a wonderful way. And results from research studies become <coughs> biased. Because if you've got a research study, clinical research study that says do FUBAR type 2 plus medication R, uh, when you have, uh, you know, when you have a particular um, assessment, then it's not necessarily going to be valid if you're basing this on this, in, in this, 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 this impression. The other thing, the o another task is to take the zillions of cells, use technical term, uh, and, and, and shapes and all of this and quantify them. Uh, and so there's a, essentially a semantic instant segmentation problem and a classification problem with a, with a huge amount of data. Okay, so this is a picture of what we're dealing with, and uh, they come in different shapes and sizes. But you see those little blotches. Those are those are nuclei. When they look funny and irregular, that's that's generally bad. The way in which they look funny and irregular varies, uh, and can be quite prognostic. Uh, there's also intermediate sized shapes, and and a whole slide image scanned in is about the same uh, amount of data as metropolitan Paris. Low, high resolution in Google Earth. We, we actually tried this with Metro New York, but you know, I'm trying to be you know, appropriately European here. Um, so it's about, so basically if you go to Google Earth and you zoom to you know, the, 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 the highest resolution satellite setting, then a single whole slide image, and a patient's gonna generate maybe 10 or 20 of them, is a you know, major metropolitan area at high power Google Earth. So th these are really big uh, data sets, um, especially given the number of patients. Okay, so. There, there is a requirement for cute animal pictures, and I rose to the challenge. Now, actually, this slide was pre-existing. I mean, everybody's like doing these cute animals. It's really disgusting. I mean, I mean okay, so, but, but this is the point that it's like 350 by 500 image net versus it could be 50K by 50K, 100K by 100K, uh, and actually these things are getting larger as one gets better resolution and depth, uh, uh, Z, depth in the Z direction. So these are large. Okay, so sort of at a, at, a, at a high level. So I'm first gonna kind of describe some of the um, you know, high level approaches. So, 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 so one is then, can you classify a whole slide image? And I'm gonna talk in some depth uh, about our own methods of doing this. And I think that this is probably pretty closely related to thing, a lot of things that other people do in the sense that if you've got a single data set, you've got a human label for the data set, you've got you know, a bunch of data sets, but I mean, you know, you're sort of classifying the data set as a whole, or at least a piece of the data, image from the data set as a whole. And then your, your algorithm has to do a multiple instance learning kind of thing, break the thing up into patches one way or the other, decide what the salient characteristics are given the training. But what I'm gonna do actually just in this overview is, uh, we did this a few years ago and I'll talk about our method, but Google and UCLA came out with a paper uh, very recently where, surprisingly enough, Google put a huge amount of money into this. Training data, as everybody knows, is very important. So they, they, they paid a lot of really amazing pathologists, experts in prostate cancer, to generate really good training data and really good ground truth. So, so, so I'm not gonna get into their algorithm, which, which was actually um, sort of related to our algorithm, but it's a couple of years later. I mean, it's really excellent. Uh, excellent work, but this is, the, this is the salient point here, which I thought was really interesting. Okay, so accuracy is defined as you've got a senior pathologist who's an expert in prostate in particular. I mean, the world's a subspecialized place, and there are certain pathologists who just do prostate, and there are a few who rise to the top of the heap, and so these are the gods of prostate pathology, and then they have uh, each one of them, for e for you, basically for each slide, you had three junior pathologists say what they saw, uh, and then the senior pathologist looked at what they said and then sort of had a little conference and said, okay, it is, you know, uh, Gleason group three, right, or, or three plus four, whatever uh, it is. Okay, so, 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 this, so this, this, was, this was the algorithm, the deep learning algorithm, uh, convolutional neural net, uh, and I'll, t I'll talk about how ours worked, and theirs was, was different, but not, you know, I mean, these things are all fairly similar, but I don't have time to get it into it, and then this was the pathologist. So the pathologist, on average, uh, individually disagreed more with the expert consensus 
than did the algorithm. But the thing that's really interesting here is, okay, so th these are you guys, right, over here. Sorry. Okay, and these are you guys. You're over here. That there's systematic bias between pathologists, which means, like, if you go to the wrong hospital or the right hospital, depending on what sort of diagnosis you want, you will get a system. So if you said, like, you know, my prostate cancer isn't that bad, I don't want them to mess with me, if you can find out who these guys are, assuming they're under reporting it, they're less, less likely to take out your prostate, right? And, and there's a trade off, right? Because if you don't take out the prostate, you'll probably be fine, depending on what it is, but you might not be, right? So there's a trade off. And, and the point is, it's not, it's not clear in any given case what the answer is, it, it, it varies but the inability to uh, consistently, so this isn't a question so much of accuracy, humans are not very consistent, as we've probably noticed in other contexts. So, so, that's, so that's, very, that's very interesting. Okay, so then an, an example of why, okay, so there's, so there's writ large, and in, in my, in my dean and, and senior hospital VP is always making jokes about me wanting to replace pathologists and all of that. And I say, well, you know, I don't actually practice pathology day to day, so I'm not worried about that. But, but, in, but in point of fact, it's a little bit like, um, uh, like an autopilot, probably with some of the main, uh, you know, the same issues as given the, seven, the 737 MAX issue, that, that algorithms will actually almost certainly be able to, it, however the user interface is designed, improve inter-observer reproducibility, um, in conjunction with actual pathologists. So, um, but, and, and from a research point of view, um, you know, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get better research results, more consistent research results. Okay, so, 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 that, so that's basically using AI uh, to create a virtual pathologist in some sense. Okay, the other thing which is in some sense uh, much more um, ambitious is to go through the process of looking at all the cells in an image and uh, saying new things about it. Okay, so probably the most topical example of that involves immune therapy and cancer, although there are lots of others. Okay, so the, the story is, um, how many people have heard of immune therapy and cancer? So a lot of people. Okay, so, so cancer, the, it's, it, it sort of stood to reason for years that there was an interaction between the immune system and people's cancer. And this has been documented and occasionally uh, treatments had been developed, but in the last you know, five, ten years, it's really become a major thing, and the mechanisms are much better understood, certainly not perfectly understood, and drugs have been developed that uh, essentially, in many cases, uh, tell a tumor to stop confusing the human, you know, your host immune system, because what tumors do is they evolve, evolve to, to, to do that. In any event, so the relationship between the tumor and immune cells is something you can get from a pathology slide. So, so if you look at a whole slide image, and so that's kind of a little thumbnail of an image uh, and stained and prepared in a way that essentially almost all cancer patients throughout the world uh, have glass slides like this. It's now pretty cheap to scan them in. And then this comes from our deep learning algorithm, which finds the immune cells and finds the tumor cells. Okay? So if you look at this and it's all yellow and there's red around the boundary, or there's no red at all, then that tells you something different, because that tells you essentially that the immune system is not reacting to the tumor, or it's trying to react to the tumor, but the tumor is repelling it. Uh, so if you, if you, um, so there's been a, a really rich literature in the last 20, 30 years, and, and really quickly uh, um, escalating, involving people who look at whole slide image and say, yep, lots of lymphocytes, yep, lymphocytes in the tumor, yep, lymphocytes outside of the tumor, like circling the tumor, and there are different names for these things. Or people do really expensive lab tests where they can actually say a lot of things about the lymphocytes, but you, you don't get that for most patients because you've got to pay like 500 to 1,000 bucks for the lab tests, and you know, so you don't really necessarily have the data. So, 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 this, so this is an area then where, um, where there's a lot of uh, interest, pre-existing interest, that the AI algorithms tell you something that pathologists want to know that makes some sort of intuitive sense and has been the focus in the last two or three years of much of our work and actually pretty broad community work. So uh, to the extent, and as I'll talk about this later, I mean, there, the, the cancer cooperative groups that, that, that manage the trials uh, are, are now having AI sessions in their, and like there was an AI, there was an AI breakout session 
uh, in the cooperative group meeting. So this is really becoming mainstream. Um, so so this, this is another picture just to get, so this is a, another whole slide image, and this is a tool that the National Cancer Institute uh, gave us a couple of grants uh, uh, to develop different parts of. And so you see, this is a heat map and, uh, of cancer. So you basically do a machine learning algorithm. I'll talk about, you, know, you find out where the cancer is, the cancer cells are, and then you can zoom in on this sort of Google Earth thing. So this is sort of a, like a map view, and then you can zoom in and look at different areas in detail. If you're a pathologist, then you can say, is it really tumor? So you get some ideas to what this thing is, 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 is doing. So uh, about three, three and a half, four years ago, we were approached uh, by a, a Cancer Genome Atlas pan-cancer group. Okay, so the Cancer Genome Atlas it was an American program. It's kind of being phased out now, which involved basically doing every conceivable molecular study on about 25,000 cancer patients with something on the order of 30 different types of tumors. So it's very deep information. Uh, we were kind of at the forefront of saying, well, you should include imagery in this because it was basically, they were basically molecular types. And so we got them to capture these uh, H&E images of the sort that I showed you, and we were approached by the group who was doing the kind of final analysis across cancers uh, to say, okay, well, we're doing molecular analysis. Can you give us uh, information about percentages of lymphocytes? So we ended up uh, working with them and uh, uh, generated a couple of papers as part of the TCGA pan-cancer atlas uh, thing. And I, I don't have time to get into it now, and I suspect many people wouldn't have the interest anyway. But it turns out that if you, the first thing, people in, 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 in this space hadn't actually used AI to generate these sorts of maps before. So first we, we developed a pipeline uh, to do this. Um, we um, generated the data for about 5,000 uh, patients, uh, and then uh, the group correlated that with all of the molecular data in a couple of uh, cell, uh, cell papers. Um, one, one, one important point that I'll kind of make later, but I want to mention now is, is so, so if we're actually grinding data out, okay, so we're doing the study, we're grinding data out, you know, what, what, what we want are these things. And then we have clustering statistics. We do statistical clustering, which isn't really important here. So the important thing is to get the right answer, right? Now, now if you've got an algorithm, and, and, and one of my guys who was wonderful, Lei Hao, uh, developed uh, an algorithm, I guess it's something on the order of, of 26, 2016. And at the time, it was a pretty good algorithm, but it required some tweaking, right? So you basically, you basically, because you, you, you did these predictions on different types of tum tumors, and we had to go through a lot of different types of tumors. So there was a transfer l learning kind of thing going on. But then for each new tumor, we'd incrementally retrain it. Lymphocytes look pretty much the same, but the background looks different. And then we, what we'd end up doing is very systematically adjusting the threshold. It turned out, at least in this particular application, um, the, 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 the nature of these maps is, are there any lymphocytes or not, three or more or not? And that threshold, uh, the appropriate choice of threshold would change. So we ended up adjusting the threshold, and then we went through and, and validated the whole thing uh, using separately generated data. The point being that, that if we had taken a sort of more uh, um, uh, machine learning, you know, okay, we're going to run the algorithm, we're going to train it, we're going to predict, we wouldn't have gotten as good an answer. And for some of the tumors, we, we wouldn't have gotten as good validation results. We might not have been able to use it at, 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 at all. So this, this relates to some of the issues, and I doubt that we're the only people that at the end of the day, if you're wearing your, okay, I'm, I'm working with the Pan-Cancer Atlas TCGA group. I want to get good data, okay? I'm not trying to prove that my deep learning algorithm is general purpose. We were very careful in the Cell Reports paper. We said, we have 5,000 images that we have validated. We're not, we're, and, we're, and we, this is how we did it. We gave the whole pipeline and the adjusting of threat. We were documented because Cell is very into documentation of these things. And it was sort of a, it, it was sort of a, uh, you know, not a, you know, just magic algorithm, push the button, out comes the answer. So, so, so I think that that's an important uh, thing, and I suspect other people, it'd be interesting to see if other people run into this. In any event, so, so sort of following on this, um, and actually can, at, at the same time as this, um, the um, National Cancer Institute uh, SEER program. So the National Cancer Institute SEER program, I doubt many people, who's heard, has anybody heard of the SEER program? No, okay, this would seem to be not the SEER audience. 
Okay, so roughly a third of cancer patients in America are carefully tracked use, uh, by, by this National Cancer Institute program, and then reports are generated, epidemiologic reports are generated, triple negative breast cancer in this group and that group. You know, people live this long and it takes that long for them to recur. So they're sort of the surveillance epidemiology arm of the National Cancer Institute. So it's like 600,000 patients, new patients a year. And the premise of this work that they funded uh, is to marry this with AI and whole slide imaging. So basically the no notion is each of these 600,000 patients have biopsies or excisions. And in principle, you can scan this data in. So for essentially a third of American cancer patients, you can look at details of the tumor immune interaction as well as how the nuclei look. You get actual physical information about the patient's tumor. So in the past, it was just like triple negative. You know, there'd be, there'd be some words that would come from a pathologist along with some description of what happened to the patient. And, and you saw the large amount of inter-observer variability and very little nuance anyway. So, so this really could have a huge, a huge impact. I mean, I'm biased, obviously, but they, they funded it. And so they, we have a pilot with three registries. Uh, and we also have uh, a, uh, another effort with 10 registries to look at extreme cases. But this was an interesting use case. So this, ki this came from our program manager. So one of the other things they're doing is they're tracking longitudinal data of how patients, uh, who's, who's, which types of patients are treated with what sort of cancer drug. So, so this came from her, and the concept, of course, is that if you can marry these things, which is the goal uh, of this, you can say, okay, here is a patient. This is how the immune cell system and the cancer are interacting. This is what the actual cells look like. This is how the patient with colon cancer was treated. And these aren't all FDA-approved indications, because in America, patients, if, 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 an F, if a drug is approved for use, a physician can use it more or less for everything. So, you know, for, uh, you know, ovarian cancer treated, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, with, with, with a particular immune uh, drug, um, what was the pathology, uh, what did the pathology look like in detail and what happened to the patient? So this, this has a potential of becoming, uh, even in one country, uh, a sort of uh, pragmatic study with 600,000 new patients a year, so millions of patients and worldwide I think it'll be uh, uh, obviously much much larger, this sort of thing. Okay, and then uh, and can, you, can you go back a slide? So there's tremendous variation. Uh, no, that chart you just showed. There's tremendous variation across a row. Is that just because one doctor prefers one thing, or were the, was there information about making them choose which one of these? No, no. This is just passively gathered. This is from claims data. So this is basically for a particular region. The National Cancer Institute got claims data, so empirically, we don't actually know why any of this happened, but there is a patient. One drug versus the other. Well, I mean, I mean, you can speculate, because obviously there are certain drugs that are approved for certain uses. Ah, okay. Right, so Pembro, for instance, this, this, this guy here is a, was, was approved for quite a while as second line treatment after your initial lung tumor treatment. So there are certain things that are approved by the FDA, certain things there's, you know, the, the, pay, the physician things are going downhill with the current treatment, let's try this. So this is just essentially, so that's the thing that's about this, that, that you could never get IRB approval to do a lot of these studies. These things aren't studies. This is actually what happened clinically. So this is an ability to marry sort of detailed information about a patient's tumor with clinical data. Um, so, 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 then, so then there's the ecog Akron group. So the use of this sort of thing uh, in clinical studies. So, so, so I was just talking about observational studies, but in clinical studies, you basically have a PI, principal investigator, uh, who says, okay, we're going to look at particular type of breast cancer, particular this treatment versus that treatment, and we're going to uh, enroll patients. They'll sign consents. They'll be randomized. They'll be either treated this way or that way. And so they're also getting involved in this. And this, 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 was, this is the big data in artificial intelligence. October 21st, uh, 24th this year. I mean, so this is really becoming, you know, people have asked me in sort of side conversations, do people think of it? I mean, this has become very hot in, in, in medicine. Uh, and so this was, this was the AI symposium. This is, this is just an example of the sort of studies where you have 
a particular drug alone or in combination with a couple of other drugs with a particular type of cancer, and then a bunch of institutions, and these things are often international, by the way, um, will find patients with the particular disease, ask if they want to be in, enrolled in the study, and if they agree, then they're randomized to this versus that. So, so what we're doing is looking at deep learning uh, and engineered features in both pathology and radiology uh, to, in an attempt to predict, you know, so basically we, we, we randomize and then you get this pathology data, you do similar things in radiology, obviously similar things in molecular, and at the end of the study, hopefully you're able to say certain patterns correlate with treatment X being better than treatment Y. So the idea is to develop what's called a biomarker to uh, guide uh, choice of treatment uh, in patients. And so by integrating this into um, these studies, this is the, this is the, the, the concept. So, uh, and, and so we're very much, uh, I'm, I'm co-lead of the, the, the radiomics group. The radiomics group is doing this stuff for radiology because the radiologists are more powerful. They get, the name, they get to name the group. Uh, but so it's a pathology radiology group. Uh, and and, and so, so we're in the process of, of designing studies as well as doing uh, ongoing in, in analysis of, of, of data. Okay, so next part of the talk, uh, analogous application domains. Okay, so as, as there's, there's, there, there are some things obviously that are unique about every application. Uh, in my view, in terms of the analytic challenges, most things are, you know, there, there are very few applications that are magic silos. And pathology is very similar to satellite image data analysis. And in fact, uh, I got started actually in digital pathology by National Science Foundation Grand Challenge Grant uh, um, with Larry Davis, uh, a computer vision guy, uh, in the 90s. Uh, and then I said, well, we can apply some of this to pathology. So I've kind of gone back and forth, more pathology than this. But in fact, many of the issues are very similar because you've got you know, very, very large two or two and a half D data sets with lots of different types of features at multiple scales. Uh, and you want to kind of label and, and classify uh, um, and then kind of draw conclusions about this. And the more heroic sort of um, uh, sensor types and really fascinating stuff the last couple of days uh, say, well, this is actually pretty easy because it sort of looks like what it is, right? I mean, as opposed to being all of these funny patterns, you have no idea what it is and you've got to classify it. But still, there's a lot of it. And, and, and generally, you can't inspect it all manually and the ability to do this routinely is, 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 is important. Okay, another area is detection of oil leaks. I'm collaborating with uh, Serge Petitan from University of Lille and Total uh, on, on that. And then another ex-collaborator, I mean, this is chosen somewhat randomly, uh, looks at uh, wind patterns and wind turbines. I mean, so these things are all kind of spatial data sets, uh, generally uh, acquired by sensors, but sometimes uh, uh, generated by scientific simulations. Um, so, so there's a bigger picture here, and I think that it's an important thing to say because, you know, basically from the standpoint of methodology, if, if people in medicine don't talk to people outside of medicine, then both sides lose. I probably used to be more that medicine would lose, but there's actually getting to be enough activity in medicine in some of these areas that I think there's probably some two-way uh, interaction. Okay, so on to some of the specific tasks. Okay, so you've got say a data set, the uh, SEER data set, uh, even the current SEER data set, or the TCGA data set with five, 10,000 images contains, you know, call it, you know, 50, 100 billion nuclei. Uh, all the cancer patients uh, in the world are going to have exonuclei. Uh, and, and so, so you really can't check these algorithms, these, these segmentations one by one. So, so this is, this was a challenge. So back in the ancient days, and there were a few groups who actually cottoned on to deep learning and segmentate, nuclear segmentation a, a couple of years before. But at least in our group, before 2017, we used traditional level set, mean shift, uh, you know, computer vision-y uh, sorts of algorithms. I worked with a variety of really excellent people who've developed these things. And they only worked okay. So what you ended up, what you're looking at is basically you run the algorithm a bunch of times and then we developed a browser that would allow students who were paid, you know, $12 an hour uh, or whatever it was, 
uh, we train them to find the areas where each algorithm would do well and then put together a mosaic. Because in the studies, you needed good nuclear segmentation. So this is how you got them. So it was like about an hour per whole slide image of, of human work, maybe two. So it was, it was um, and, and, and there were, if you, if you do a Google Scholar search or whatever, you probably see 10,000 or more papers on nuclear segmentation before 2015. And, and it was all declared to be a victory, usually with leave one out validation, and it basically would only work on one data set. Well, maybe two data sets, but they, they were not very robust. Uh, and then what I'm saying, there, there, there had been ongoing interest, this is a paper we did in 2012, in what you do with these things in terms of predicting outcome and sometimes response to treatment. So there was definitely interest in this, but you couldn't really do it at scale. And so this is, these are some, old, what would happen is, is that single nuclei would get uh, uh, sort of broken into lots of little clumps. You'd, you'd have these funny, you know, thing, you'd get big clumps, you'd get little, little clumps. It did pretty well at, at identifying nuclear material. Uh, but 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 not not so not so good at actually segmenting nuclei. Um, so one of the things that came up in discussions is lack of training sets. So actually, our group, uh, in conjunction with a bunch of other people, do you know generate uh, um, public uh, public validation sets in the Mackay Image Processing Conference. Toss and Kirk uh, uh, leads leads this, but but really you're talking a few. Tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand maximum uh, examples in a few tissue types, and so these are huge images, and there's lots of heterogeneity. Uh, so this is the Mackay challenge, uh, and and actually the group uh, Pathlake group um, from uh, uh, Warwick, which actually I guess I'm an external faculty, and they're they're really very good, uh, won the challenge. So. Uh, our NCI people who sponsored this, you've got to do a paper, you've got to do a paper. Yeah. So we wrote, we described the challenge as, along with their winning uh, application uh, um, uh, in, in this. Okay, so nuclear segmentation. So relative to what we were uh, talking about, so these are examples. So you're circling these brown spots and uh, purple spots, and you know, obviously lots of people in lots of applications have to circle uh, spots uh, reliably. And so, so with respect to training data, so the, so the issue is, that you take a patch, a little you know, image net size patch, it's, it's, a good, it's a good few days to get a really nice uh, human nuclear seg segmentation. So they're you know, they're going to be maybe 100 nuclei, and you've got to circle them carefully. It's harder than you think. And then the students do that, and they're checked by pathologists. So, 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 um, so one, of the, one of the approaches then, which I think is, is, should be generalizable, is to use GANs to generate artificial tissue, and then since you know the answer to the artificial tissue, you can then uh, generate huge amounts of training data. So this, this was actually published by Lei Hao, uh, who is uh, jumping ship from academia and moving to Google uh, in, in a couple of weeks uh, after he's a brilliant guy finishing his PhD uh, in this, uh, and Demi uh, uh, Demetrius Samaras, uh, his uh, deep learning uh, advisor. And the premise of the thing and I, and I won't go into, into, into details because I don't, I, don't, I don't have time. And frankly, I don't know that the details in the context of this discussion are that important now that I've heard so many other people doing things that are uh, different, uh, similar, but you know, with different, different, you know, different tweaks. But basically, the deal is, is that you have lots of different, it's not just that you don't have enough training data, it's that you have different types of tissue for which you have no training data at all. So nuclei, nuclei look different in different types of, 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 of tissue. So there's sort of a up by the bootstraps process associated with uh, developing a GAN mechanism to sanity check um, artificial tissue uh, using both, you know, sort of using using um, real tissue, but with un uh, with with no with no with no ground truth. So so it's it's a fairly elaborate process, which which um, in, in which crude synthetic tissue is generated by a relatively ad hoc process. Uh, a GAN iterates to improve it, and then uh, part of the GAN, one of the arms of the GAN, compares against actual samples of an unseen tissue type, and at the end of this, you end up with a weight which says how good the, the GAN and the, and the, and the uh, um, algorithm think the thing is, and then that's used in the final loss function. And, and this actually seemed to work quite well, and all being well before this guy graduates, um, He's promised, you know, we, we've, we've made 5,000 whole slide images worth of nuclei, about 10 billion nuclei publicly available as part of the CBPR paper. 
and we're preparing a submission to Nature Data because we're going through some extra validation that I could talk offline. And then assuming uh, that's all successful, there'll be a sort of community data set with something like 10 billion um, machine learned, generated, but reasonably validated uh, nuclear segmentation data. So I think, and I think that's actually probably a prototype of a lot of what we're doing. are these things always 2D because of the way they're prepared? Um, well, they're 2D for two reasons. Okay, well, one, one is, and they're not always 2D, but okay, so what, what I've been talking about actually are samples that come from patients uh, in, in the hospital. Okay, now, if you take a block of tissue and you want to generate a 3D image, which we do when we've got grants, you, know, you can do that. Okay, but the thing is, is that if you're basically going to a hospital, you're going to a SEER system, you're going to a, to a cooperative group, you get what you get. Right. That's what it does. So it's in terms of so in terms of scaling, so one of the things that's really important is is that I could have given a, I could give a different talk about you know heroic analyses where you take a block of tissue and you do combined spatial molecular analysis and so 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 there's one approach where you say I'm going to optimize the number of patients I can look at and say okay there is data it's sort of like high it's sort of like you know high Earth orbit satellite data you get really good coverage but then you have to struggle to get resolution. Or you can take a much smaller number of patients and do much more to get resolution, but then you don't get the coverage. So no, it's not necessarily 2D. This is just what the hospitals give us in this particular context. But it's, it's a good question. Okay, so, um, so okay, so, so uh, and, and another thing we actually did was to have pathologists guess whether tissue was fake or not. And they could sometimes tell, they sometimes couldn't. Uh, but then we also looked at it by the sampling weight. So in other words, if the algorithm thought that the, uh, that, that the thing was terrible, then, uh, then, then um, pathologists thought it was terrible too. Um, so, uh, so, so, so anyway, so, so, there's, so that, these are examples of, of, of the weights. Okay, so then the other sort of issue that I had alluded to is the, here's a big data set, pathologist gives it a name, FUBAR3, You've got hundreds or thousands of these things. Can you develop an algorithm that will figure out why the heck the pathologist is saying this? And, and I, this is, seems like this has got to be a fairly important issue in some of these other uh, uh, areas. But before I get into that, I'm just going to say, just, just as a context, so, so we went through this whole voyage of doing computer-aided pathology classification in the mid-2000s with sort of uh, you know, lovingly developed bespoke machine learning algorithms took about five years, worked with a fellow by the name of Hiro Shimada, published a bunch of papers in pattern recognition. What we ended up with, it worked pretty well, but it was very brittle, and it was just for one tumor. So it's not like nobody could ever do this, and there are a few other people doing this, but it was a huge amount of work. Uh, so now you have the return of the, of the acute animals, uh, the, the, the image, and the, the thing about this multiple instance learning kind of thing is, is for a given type of tumor, these are, these are, these are samples that that for given overall huge image classification, actual patches can be really different from one another. So for GBM, patches can look like this or that or a bunch of other things. And what, and what, the, what, the, what the challenge is is that within a given image, different portions can be consistent with different labels. So you have to do some sort of a multiple instance thing in order to figure out, given pathologist training, which patches were salient to the pathologist training and then, and, then, and then use those. So I won't get into details, and again, there have actually been a number of analogous things that people have, have, have discussed, but it's an, it's an iterative process of classifying patches and then asking how the, the patch classifications roll up to the pathology uh, diagnosis. And there have been a number of new ways of doing this, uh, so histogram of patch classes, and then, it's, and then we tried a bunch of things like uh, pooling, logistic regression, well, ultimately ended up with, with, with a two-stage process that did use logistic re regression for this. And what we ended up with was a pathology classification that uh, was not in perfect agreement with what uh, we trained, you know, well, we had separate holdout training set, but, but it was, it was the, 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 the F1 uh, and accuracy were, were pretty good. But then when you looked at the confusion matrix, it turned out that the major things that people looked for, a GBM, uh, was, were, were very good and, 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 and 
classification such as oligoastrocytoma, which has been dropped because humans did very badly on it. Uh, we did very badly on it. So one of the ways we validated this thing, and we published this in CVPR uh, as well, is you know, basically pathologists seem to agree to 0.7 to 0.8 uh, on these sorts of uh, uh, studies. I think actually the Google study that I cited is much better in terms of really nailing the jelly to the wall in terms of pathologists versus algorithm uh, agreement with these sorts of algorithms, but we don't have as much money as Google. It's a huge, <laughs> huge amount of work to do, but I thought it was very valuable. Okay, finally, uh, label super resolution, um, and very interested in this, 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 this sort of thing. Our, our particular uh, uh, approach th then is that you can get, a, you can get a, a label for a whole image, you can get a label for a patch, you might want to segment things, and you want to couple these things, and, uh, and, and our group, um, Lei Hao again actually was the lead on this, and Dim Dimitris, uh, along with uh, a really excellent group of people uh, at Microsoft who we collaborate with, uh, sort of developed a uh, super resolution uh, algorithm which, um, which, which, which links, links these things. And, and I don't have time to go into it, but it, and it's a, it, obviously it's a very interesting thing because there, this, this is also being independently developed, or ways of doing this are, are being independently developed. This isn't necessarily the best one. But one of the things I think that's really interesting about this group and sort of, um, you know, defining, uh, just getting back to, um, to what, what Tony, what Tony uh, Hayes group is trying to do, defining common benchmarks. We say, okay, here is a two or three dimensional benchmark, set of benchmarks from different application domains where we're going to give you some patch based training data. We're going to give you some, a little bit of very fine grained training data. We're going to give you whole data set training data. And really, uh, being able to sort of break the bounds of, well, this is this particular uh, application because you're really doing very similar, similar sorts of things. Um, the, the data on and satellite, uh, satellite data was actually very impressive. The, the particular context there was coarse grain land use information being interpolated onto fine grain uh, satellite, uh, satellite data. And so the coarse grain data came from uh, a U.S. database involving uh, land use, and then there was ground truth from the Chesapeake Bay uh, region. Uh, so then comparing essentially super resolution model output with high resolution model output in, in, in land use classification uh, with, some, with some, nice, some nice numbers. Finally, wrapping up, there are some, there are some offline discussions about um, UQ and uncertainty quantification or how you know you're getting the right answer. So our approach to this so far, it's actually predated our experience with GANs which is if you think of a GAN and you sort of divorce the, the task from the GAN and you just have a GAN, you know, you just basically have the evaluator as a machine learning based busybody evaluator, like you train it to decide, you know, what's a good segmentation, what's a bad segmentation, and then it generates a map and says what's good and what's bad. You can certainly do that. And it's, it's not perfect, but it certainly uh, beats looking at every uh, 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 nucleus. And, and so actually one of our students got a, a PhD uh, based on this and is now working at the FDA. So we're collaborating with the FDA. They're developing methodology for uh, validation of AI algorithms. So she joined uh, Brandon uh, Gallus's group uh, on this. So, 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 so basically, I, it, it seems pretty clear that deep learning can be used to critique deep learning at some level with GANs. It routinely is already. But if you, as you said, if you, it's a slightly different problem because different people will generate um, um, segmentations, markups, annotations, segmented nuclei, whatever it happens to be, uh, that purport to be correct. And then this inspector, this busybody inspector deep learning algorithm says, do I believe it? And the challenge is that they've never seen the data before. But if you showed, but if you showed a person like circled you know, dark spots, you could say, you know, is it doing a reasonable job? So you can teach an algorithm to do that. You can do that too. So anyway, so wrapping up, so, we, so, so just um, lots of this, this, this work and this collaboration uh, involves uh, a bunch of different consortia, some of which we lead and some of which, such, such as ECOG Akron, uh, I play uh, just very specific uh, uh, role, role in. Um, and uh, a, our, our local deep learning faculty uh, in pathology is growing. We have about uh, 10 other uh, deep learning people in other areas, but uh, these, are, these are the folks 
uh, from, from the, uh, from the um, faculty uh, level. And then really quite a diverse team of grad students, developers, as well as collaborators from different universities, uh, our uh, uh, NCI <coughs> team that actually builds uh, tools and these sorts of things, uh, the team dedicated to the SEER, uh, SEER group, and another tool developing group I didn't have time to go into, but probably be potentially relevant to some of this work in the sense that the process of categorizing and keeping track of data sets and data products such as maps and, and metadata is something that everybody you know, needs. And at least in our space, there wasn't anything really close enough. So we, uh, we, we ended up getting funding uh, to develop a combined radiology pathology sort of metadata management, data metadata management system, uh, which is container and cloud-based. So that's, that's that group. So, um, so uh, uh, funding from various folks and, uh, and, and uh, National Cancer Institute Supercomputer Centers. We, the, as I mentioned, we have a new Insight uh, grant uh, from the DOE with the PRISM, uh, with the Prism uh, team, but uh, we haven't done anything yet. We just found out about it. Um, uh, so thanks, happy to take questions. Thank you, Jude. So we have time for a couple of questions. Who's first? I have a question which is not technical at all, but we have, we have heard in the f first day, James was saying that as a joke that AI makes mistake, it doesn't matter. And then he was showing, it, it, what? it oh. does not matter. And then he was showing the picture of the crash Tesla, meaning that sometimes it matters if AI makes mistake. In your case, it is even more sensible because when you apply this behind, you have real patients. Uh, are the patients ready to accept the fact that a machine will tell them what, what their s disease is and how they are, they are going to be treated and so on? Well. Patients are not going to be treated by AI alone, right? I mean, it's, it's a little bit like saying, okay, get on your 737 MAX, and by the way, we don't need pilots. Okay, so even, even you know, so, right. So, so an AI, I'm sure, will sometimes like self-driving cars, even if they're not totally self-driving cars, if, if, you, if you have a nice Tesla that seems to be doing a good thing and then you know, you're supposed to be watching the road, but it seems to be doing fine, and you stop watching the road, the thing crashes. So there is indeed a danger that the AI will work well enough that physicians won't pay enough attention. I mean, we're really so far from the situation of hands-off, autopilot, drone medicine. You know, we're really barely at the point where the stuff is useful even for uh, advice. But then the other, th the other response I have is the FDA, okay, which, which, you know, is just the American solution, but Basically, the regulatory agencies are very concerned about this. But I think actually in the case of the FDA, at least the folks, we were very in a constructive way. So they're saying, okay, if you want to actually use the thing clinically rather than in research, because what I'm talking about is research, then you've got to get it past the FDA. Okay, so what the FDA is doing is developing standards for AI validation data sets. And so we're involved in this actually. and 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 and. There are data sets for particular things. So tumor infiltrating lymphocytes is one of the things that they're, that they're looking at. So they basically have a whole mechanism of getting um, validation data, not academic style, but you know, really regulatory style. And then they decide what's enough. They organize it. They put it in a secret place. And then if you want to show that your AI algorithm should be cleared by the FDA, you've got to get it past their hurdle, along with other things. right? So, so the intent is that there be a, a regulatory mechanism. So then if you say, I, you know, I'm going to tell you, um, you know, whether, you know, I mean, you, you, have, you, have to have, you have to have an application that makes some sort of sense to get cleared by the FDA. So, um, and, and, and a lot of this stuff is exploratory. I mean, so fundamentally, if we work with CALGB or SEER and say a certain pattern of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes is significant, then that becomes part of, you know, adopted. Now, there are a few, okay, so in the case of actually triple negative breast cancer, uh, there's this extremely enthusiastic fellow by the name of Salgado who runs this uh, group of immune cancerness with a bunch of physicians. So he managed to get the pathology community to recommend tumor infiltrating lymphocyte patterns 
as a, a mechanism for um, predicting, you know, predicting outcome of triple negative breast cancer. But what he recommended was the human version. It's the, you know, these things are very incremental. So that's once you have the human version blessed appropriately, then you can say, can we validate it? And we actually have a few papers addressing that issue. So it's, it's not going to happen that quickly. Yeah. One quick question David. over there. So there's lots and lots of you know, image processing algorithms, AI based, et cetera. You know, Pelt and I have one, et cetera. Is that what you need right now? So in the panoply of things out there, workflow, more data, statistics, et cetera, what do you think you need most to make a, more progress? Um, I, I, think, I think actually, and, and, and thanks for mentioning this, because I think actually we probably don't have to invent new algorithms at all. What I would like, okay, so this is, this, in fact, if, 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 if any of the folks in this group have good postdocs or grad students who want to spend some time with us to, you know, essentially, I mean, we, we, can, we can shed insight into new algorithm development and make people who develop new algorithms happy. We've done this for years. I'm not an deve algorithm developer myself, but, uh, but, but, but to your point, the workflow is the important thing. Validation is the important thing. There's such a, a, such a wealth of new algorithms out that that really, I actually kind of struggle to find people who actually want to implement these things in an engineering workflow. Basically, what I end up having to do is to take academically minded computer science students and then you know promise them an occasional CVPR paper. And then, you know, as, as the labor they have to do in order to, <laughs> to earn this, I, I have to get them to do actual work uh, <laughs> on, on these projects. That's my experience in getting software engineers to sit down and take all camera algorithms to make it so others can use it. So that's exactly the question. Yeah, yeah. I have one question to you. I mean, uh, you are basing, of course, your work on medical data. No, I mean, isn't that the um, fundamental limitation? Is the data openly accessible? Oh, oh, much of it is. I mean, some of it is, some of it isn't. But, but I, I think actually the United States is a little more relaxed about this. Probably, yes. It's so de-identified. Okay, so the TCGA data is all open. Our IRB has said that if we go through a particular process, we can make whole slide image from our, our health system uh, open. The SEER group may actually be making some of their data open. It seemed like they wouldn't. But, but it seems that, that at least some of, the, some of the work we're doing. So it, it's, it's, it's always a bit of a struggle, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's definitely, it's, I mean, the thing about whole slide imaging data, unlike genetic data, is you know, it's common, you know, I mean, you look at the, you've looked at these pictures, I mean, you're not gonna say this is Joe Schmidt, right? <laughs> I mean, so, so really, if you say, if you, if you capture some de-identified information about the context, but nothing, nothing about dates, nothing about names, nothing about places, right. and, and, and you have the image data. You, you, I mean, a lot of people don't want to give the data, frankly, more for proprietary reasons, because there are a bunch of companies they want to make money on. But there's so much cancer in the world, it is not that hard. You're, I mean, not, you're not struggling with uh, incompatible data formats yeah. and... Uh, oh, yeah, 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 no, I didn't get into that. I mean, it's not struggling. I mean, we're funded to, to do some of that stuff. All right, so we, okay. we have tools actually that, uh, and we work with other groups. So it's a whole story in and of itself. But it's it's not a it's not a it's not a show. But these are just the common types of data. So I, I I I could give a whole different talk about the more custom types of of imaging data where the data formats are weirder and, and well, less imagine. less okay. standard. Well, now we need to move forward. So let's thank uh, Joel again. Okay, so our next speaker is Sofia Vallecorsa from the CERN. CERN. 
who will tell us about uh, using AI for detector simulation. Exactly. So, and before I start, I would like to bet that I'm going to win the cute animals competition that apparently has been, <laughs> you know, started. And you will tell me at the end of the talk, okay? So, um, but please pay attention to the rest as well. <laughs> um, so, how do I do that? Now, I can't help but starting by describing what CERN is. I'm sure for all the people here in Grenoble, I mean, we are neighbors, so probably you know everything about it, but for those of you that came from different fields and from abroad, let me just spend a few minutes describing what we do. So, CERN is an international laboratory that was funded in the 50s with the idea of spreading, you know, building science for peace. Uh, we now grow, so this is, yes. We now grow to huge numbers. We have a total of more than 13,000 associate scientists that come and do, do their research at CERN. And we have more than 3,000 people that are CERN employees who are actually full-time at CERN. And you can see the number of states that are actually part of this collaboration. Now, the main the high energy physics accelerator that we have at CERN is the Large Hadron Collider. So uh, this is a 27 kilometer ring that is built across the, the Swiss-French border close to Geneva. We have four major experiments that run around it. There are two general purpose one, one is called ATLAS, one is called CMS. They're really huge. I mean, ATLAS is more than 40 meters high. So uh, you don't see this in this kind of you know, pictures I put here, but I just want to stress already from this slide number three, what, are, what is the dimension of the, of the physics problem that we have to solve? We have two additional experiments, ALICE and LHCB. They are more focused on some specific, you know, the point is that they want to uh, achieve higher accuracy results on some specific fields of physics. So this is kind of makes them different from, from the ATLAS and CMS approach. So in general, just to give you some numbers, because I want to cut it short, otherwise I can't talk to you about the cute animals. Um, so uh, the, the LHC collides uh, protons or heavy ions for sus during some specific uh, uh, runs. At a very high rate, we have uh, heard on the, of the order of 100 of collisions every 25 nanoseconds. This means that we collect, we, 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 we have collision data at a 40 megahertz rate. Now, yesterday the, the, the point was raised about storing or not storing all the data that is collected, that is produced, we don't do that. Of course, we cannot, there is no way we could store or even process all the data that the, the accelerator produces. So what we do is actually just select a little bit, a tiny bit of it actually. So one hertz of data is what's actually stored and then processed. But even so, uh, in December 2018, we reached 30, 330 petabytes of data that is stored on our disks and so that we process and analyze. Now, this comes because uh, of the high granularity, this happens because of the high granularity and of the sizes of our detectors. How do we do that? I, I, I have to also mention our computing infrastructure, which so far has been relying mostly on the LHC computing grid, the first example of distributed computing, where distributed means really distributed across the whole globe. You know, again, here I collected some numbers. We are talking about 800,000 cores mostly CPU cores, almost entirely, I should say, CPU cores. We are talking about uh, 600 petabyte of storage and uh, about 2 million jobs that run every day, uh, each day, uh, the whole day. Now, this is kind of the, you know, the framework, the background. Uh, where, what do we use deep learning for? So basically, we use deep learning at every single step in the experiment lifetime, from the moment we do Production, okay, actually let me re rephrase that. We've been using machine learning algorithms to do analysis of our data since many, many years, since the 90s basically. We started introducing deep learning in the past few years in all the fields that you see now. So analysis of course, uh, and anomaly detections applied to new physics searches in particular as far as the real-time selection is concerned because we have very stringent requirement in terms of latency and of the efficiency of our real-time selection algorithms given that we throw away most of the data. Data quality, uh, quality uh, monitoring but also we work, we, we work a lot on control systems. In particular our beam division is one of the 
sections at CERN that's been using and developing deep learning for uh, maintenance, for monitoring since, since longer, the longest. Uh, simulation is what I will uh, discuss today, but we also use deep learning, or at least we started recently to try and use it to optimize our computing resources. And of course, the interpretability, the understanding of, of uh, networks, of, of models, performance has been a hot topic now since a few years, and I think, I think that the reason is clearly connected to the fact that we are starting to use those tools to make publications. And so they need to be verifiable, reproducible, and inter interpretable. So that is also a lot of work that is ongoing in this direction. But I will talk to you about simulation. And why do I talk to you ab uh, about simulation? Because simulation is a data problem. In which sense? Um, we do use simulation uh, to do a lot of things. We use simulation when we want to uh, design new detectors, we use simulation when we want to understand how the detectors perform, we will use simulation when we want to compare to specific theoretical models. So today, more than 50% of the LHC computing grid is devoted to run simulation. It's, this, uh, this number actually gets, it, I mean, it's well above 50%. We go closer to 70, 80%, depending on the uh, period of time. If you get closer to conferences and everybody wants to do data processing, maybe slightly less, but. So we know that the, for the next high luminosity LHC run, which will start, depending who you ask, between 2025 and 2028, we know that those needs will increase by a factor 100. So there is no way we can keep up the way we do simulation today, which is strictly uh, related, uh, relying on Monte Carlo approach. There is also another reason why, and if you want, it's an indirect reason. Since so, much of our, so many of our resources are devoted to simulation because we use our gri the grid to, to process it and because we need to store this simulation, there is much less that can be devoted to actually store and process real data. So if we make simulation more efficient, if we have to, for example, stop um, storing it, then we open up many more possibilities as far as collision, storing more of the data that is produced by the accelerator is concerned. So, in general, simulation is a very time consuming. This is our Monte, pure Monte Carlo. In particular, as far as detector output is concerned, there are specific classes of detectors that are particularly heavy in terms of simulation. Calorimeters, so detectors that are used to measure energy of the particles are one such example, there are others, but those are for all the general purpose experiments, for all collider experiments, those are by far, they, you spend about 60% of the time in the total simulation uh, budget simulating calorimeters. Why? Because, well, they are supposed to measure the energy of the particle, so they are usually very heavy, so they are made of dense materials because you want the particle to deposit most of their energy when they go through it. They are highly segmented, so they means they are split in very s a high number of small uh, volumes, and you want to read out all of them. And so when you try to do the simulation, if you do that with GN4, which is state of the art, and it works, works perfectly, I would say, uh, with, with a... Um, a very high level of accuracy, then this is going to, to, to be extremely expensive in terms of computation because you are going to have to reproduce one by one the, the behavior of each one of the particles that is created by the interactions of the primary particles within your detector. So, it's been years already that people have been looking into alternatives, so especially for cases in which we could give up some of that accuracy that GN4 gives us for, for you know, a faster approach. Um, so we've developed through the, the different experiments I've developed through the years, parameterized approaches, lookup tables, pre-compiled libraries that you can use to replace specific parts of the simulations. Now, deep learning gives us the, 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 the possibility to actually improve this direction. Now, this very complex para parabola here it's just showing you, I don't really want to go into the details, there's a lot of information, we can discuss this <laughs> for, for a long time. What I wanted to say is that when you go through the simulation, you go through a set of steps that are more and more time consuming in terms of processing. Um, so basically this part of the chain is the one that it's making your simulation look like the raw data that you collect from your detector and then the processing pi pipeline becomes the same from simulated and raw data basically. So 
you can apply, uh, you can try to speed up simulation at different levels. This is what we do today in most cases. So basically, just trying to reproduce to, to reproduce the output of our detector. But of course, if you could, from starting from a very, very simple description of the primary collision uh, uh, conditions, get directly to the final physics observables. This is what we call the super fast simulation. This is another avenue that is being researched and that is being very well covered by generative models. And I will just give you an example about it because most of the talk is actually about this. So, uh, this was also already mentioned uh, in one of the talks that uh, was presented yesterday. Why do we want to do that? If we prove that we can keep uh, a reasonable level of accuracy compared to Gion 4, given how quickly, it, how fast is the, is the use of generative models once they've been trained, of course, and we can discuss about how long it takes to train those models, uh, the comparison to standard the Monte Carlo is almost unfair. You have 20,000 speed, factor speed up on the high end uh, Xeon uh, server, Intel, uh, Intel x86 architecture. I don't even want to mention what is the speed up if you put a GPU here. So if you run your inference on a GPU or on a FPGA. Unfortunately, Gen 4 does not run on GPUs. I didn't want to make the comparison too bad. <laughs> so let's discuss generative models. So they've been discussed in bits and pieces. I've seen those in some of the talks I follow. I wasn't here, I apologize to, others, to some of the speakers. I wasn't here the whole time. Um, but just for those of you who are not so familiar, there is a very simple, uh, how should I say, um, example or, or, or way of reasoning to get to the point of what a generative model does. And this is something that you probably do every day in your physicist life which is this trying to solve this problem. So assuming that your data sample follows some di distribution that you don't know, what you want to do is to draw samples from a distribution or from a model distribution that somehow resembles to the unknown data models. So now, there is a very simple way of, of very well-known way of solving this problem, which is the, the maximum likelihood estimator, of course. So what does it mean? That you, that you assume some form of your, for your model distribution and then you use the data to fit the parameters in your, in your model, in your model distribution. And then you draw samples from this obtained estimated, uh, estimated distribution. Now, this is basically the same kind of problem you're trying to solve with a generative model. With the big difference that in most cases, you don't assume any prior for your model. And uh, you let the model, the generative model, directly learn the distribution from data. Now, of course, there are many different ways to go about it. The, those are, those are um, list, this is a non-comprehensive list of generative models of different kinds, categorized by Danilo Resendez. In fact, if you are interested in this, I, I encourage you to look for tutorials and talks that he's been giving around. He's really, really expert on the field, but also very good at explaining those. Uh, so then you can take up my slides later on and you can try to find information about each one of those models. It's going to take you a very, very long time, actually. So, but, but I just wanted to stress one point. Um, so this is my cute animal slides. You have to admit <laughs> that it's, uh, it has its own uh, peculiarity. So what is the point with generative models? Why do they, they have been existing for quite some time? but why they are so, so popular now. The reason is the deep, which is in front of deep generative models. And the reason is that shallow models, uh, so models that we could train and understand when we didn't have enough data and enough computing resources to train deeper one, could just learn very you know, simple um, repre uh, um, representations of the data. So there wasn't much generalization you could do. There, wasn't ma there weren't many... Um, um, uh, how, uh, what did I write there? Uh, uh, yes, very complex structures, exactly, that they could learn. Now, if you, uh, the more you increase the depth of your model, the more you can improve on those kind of, on those two avenues. And what happens is that then you can use it for many, many different applications. From making like kind of nightmares cats to, you know, use them for discovery, anomaly detection, uh, and, uh, and uh, planning, and some, some, of, some of the examples were already presented here. Uh, most of the examples that I saw discussed variational autoencoders. We use them too. 
Uh, but I'm going to discuss generative adversarial networks because they've been mentioned and even just, just before me. Um, but maybe not all of you have know how this work, these networks work. How many of you know how generative networks work? Because if you, there's enough of you, then I can just skip, but there's not enough of you, or at least you didn't answer. <laughs> so, okay, let's just me quickly say that generative, the idea behind the generative adversarial network, I like it very much because what you're doing is training a, gener a generator, so the network that you want to, to use to then you know, simulate your data, by m using another network as a supervisor. This is a very cool uh, 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 concept, if you, if you like. It goes in the direction of the AI approach, where you are automatizing the most that you can, you know, uh, more complex tasks. Uh, well, it was introduced not long ago. The first paper is from 2014. And since then, the, the evolution of the models was straight, uh, was, was in, um, um, unbelievable. These were among the first results. This was actually produced in 2017. Does any of you understand what those kind of pictures are? Maybe people in the back are, are, are adva have an advantage on this, this low resolution. Do you know? What, can you guess what those are? Those pictures are more cute animals. <laughs> so <laughs> they are supposed to be animals. So dogs, cats. Actually, they mostly look like muffins or I don't know some, some kind of nightmarish. Uh, animals. So those were the first results that were used, that were produced by GAN. It actually already showed, they were actually very good results in the sense that, I mean, I don't, uh, yeah, I have to move forward, but, but basically what this nightmare images already told you is that GANs were very good at understanding local features, but at that time still had troubles in trying to organize them correctly along the whole special organization of the, of the image. So that's why you could see ears and eyes that were spread around kind of randomly. Now, the situation is not like that anymore. Uh, I don't think I have to convince you that they work very well for a lot of different applications. If you go to that link, you can generate every time you click a different, you know, a different not existing person. And so this is, uh, this is really impressive what you could get uh, in just a few, just a couple of years. This is uh, work that was published by NVIDIA last year. Uh, but of course, um, if we want to use those models in our field, we have to be a little bit more um, less sen sensational, I would say, and a little bit, bit more robust. Well, first of all, we have some problems that we need to solve. So how do we recast our problems in a way that is deep learning friendly? Okay, this means that if I want to, to simulate a detector output, I have to be able to, to uh, reformulate in some way that, for example, I can use image uh, recognition techniques. If I want to describe a particle jets and uh, with a, with a recurrent neural network, I should probably try and interpret those as sentences. And same if I want to reconstruct particle trajectories in a very messy environment, maybe I should think of those as graphs, and then I can use graph neural networks. Um, that is the second part. A second part of it, which is, it was, has, was highlighted also by the previous speaker, is how do you, uh, how, how much work, in fact, this is not a question, <laughs> it's a statement. There is a huge amount of work that you have to make in order to do validation. Of those, of those models. And in the case of generative models, you are actually stuck with a lot of different things that you should check. Uh, for example, the mixing and the coverage, so that the level of diversity in the sample that you generate is what you expect, that the, all the quantities that are specific of some, of some particular sample are actually reproduced correctly by the network, that there is no mode collapse or dropping, that the network is not memorizing specific samples and producing them and giving them back to you when you run inference, and that it's not just making a patch composition of different you know, small pieces of the original samples. Uh, there are two more parts that are important. So we have a big leverage. We know everything about our physics model and our detector. So that knowledge has to get somehow into the, into the training and of the network. And last but not least, and unfortunately I will not have time to discuss this, but it is very important for our community to understand how the use of those models is modifying our computing model, which so far was not thought or, or, or designed in order to be efficient to do this kind of workloads. Luckily, most of the validation that we can do can actually rely on physics-related quantities because in the end, this is what we care about. So let me go into some uh, examples because I'm already very late. Um, 
so this is an example of the way you can treat calorimeter output with, as an image or as, as a three-dimensional image in particular. This is a volume. So we just pixelize it. We choose as an example, an example of a high granularity. So an example of a calorimeter, the way they will be designed for the next generation uh, colliders. So you can run a three-dimensional convolutional gun. Uh, this is not a standard architecture. We have redesigned re, uh, it and optimized it in order to, to fit our problem. However, I would like to stress that this is a relatively small sample uh, network with respect to what standard algorithms such as ResNet, ImageNet, or any other convolutional neural network are. are. And you can use it to uh, build, uh, to reproduce very nice looking events, very realistic. We were very happy with initial, with initial results. Uh, we had to go through some more detailed validation. It, cons it is made up of more than 238 plots, I believe. I just chose a few of those, just because I, I wanted to, ex to show you how we can get you know, overall quantities very well. This is a quantity that's just measured, uh, measuring the, the total response of the calorimeter. We can reproduce um, geometrical features of our energy patterns very well. We can even reproduce over 100, over many orders of magnitude, the single pixel intensity. Um, so the, 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 the energy that's deposited in single cell, and I'm very proud of these plots, uh, we can reproduce very well the internal correlations that are uh, uh, described by GM4. Uh, so that is the kind of physics quantity validation you do. You can also go further and try to use techniques that are actually done, used more in different fields. For example, one typical, when people try to measure how good are generated images, they look at uh, inception score. We don't have inception. I mean, we cannot run inception on our data. We did something similar. So we went to look for a network that is trained to do classification and energy estimation from, from, you know, from this calorimeter data. And we compare its performance, compared its performance on our generated data and on the GN4 data. And you can clearly see how they, they match. We also want to look a little bit more into understanding the composition of the, of, the, of the samples, and we were happy to see that we match what's happening in, um, in GEM4. So we were, what, this set of slides is really wanted to, to show you that these models can give you the, the accuracy in terms of physics results that you need to actually use them. That is another thing, quickly, that I want to, I want to show you. A, a, couple, a couple more things. So this is another example about generative adversarial networks applied to calorimeters. Uh, uh, this is a different kind of calorimeter than a calorimeter that exists today in the ATLAS detector. It's a very complex structure. The whole point is this plot. I'm showing you this. Uh, so this is a different gun. Uh, it was trained on a specific energy point, and the, this group proved that GAN could actually do interpolation. So the results that they obtained by trying to use the GAN on a different energy point than the one that we use for training, so was working very well. In the computer science world, this would be generalization. In our case, we call it interpolation. We were very happy with this result. Because remember, all of those tools are trained using simulated data. But if you want to use generative models to, rep to replace simulation, <laughs> you need to try and restrict to the mi maximum that you can the simulated data that you need to train them. Otherwise, there's no point. So networks can also do interpolation. And that is another interesting example that I'm going to show you. This is not about describing or, or generating detector output. This goes all the way to the other end of the para parable, parable, par parabola, parabola, yes, thanks. <laughs> parabola that I showed you at the beginning. So we are directly, this, this group is directly generating physics quantities, final physics quantities, what you would use for your analysis. But the interesting thing, again, here, is the fact that they trained the network up to a certain point, and they wanted to see what happens for those very low cross-section uh, uh, parts of the spectrum. So for those parts of the spectrum for which they have very few data samples in the training set. And they compared what they get from the GAN with what you would do in a normal, uh, you know, in a normal classical, let's say, approach, so with a fit. And you can see that the result is very, very, very close. So extrapolation apparently works also very well. Uh, CMS example, uh, I will not go through it. Uh, I just wanted to say those, are, those were all examples of convolutional GANs 
we are actually looking into many more models. This is an example for uh, this is an example uh, use case in which maybe convolutions are not the best because the, the because of the energy not the energy the geometrical shape. Um, but we are looking into graph uh, generative adversarial networks to do this. Complex geometry, uh, if you look through my slides later, there's plenty of examples that I didn't have time to mention. I just wanted to, to resonate again on what was shown before. GANs are also very good at refining simulation. You, cannot, you should not think of them as just as something that can replace Monte Carlo, but you can also think of it as something that can improve your Monte Carlo simulation for those cases in which you don't manage to get a clear description of your detector. So you then you can train a GAN to do that for you, starting from, uh, from simulation. And of course, there's a lot of work that is ongoing also in improving the way we include domain knowledge into the training. And before ending, I will just finish with some brand new work that we started doing this year. So you should know that uh, CERN Open Lab in particular started an initiative on quantum computing at CERN. So we are very much into, into generative adversarial network. We couldn't help but try and see what could happen in trying to, to implement this on a quantum computer. Now, I don't have time to discuss why this could be I mean, feasible or interesting. The, the, the important thing is that we believe that we could get a better representation of, our, of, the, of the hidden PDF with a, low, a smaller training sample. And so this is some work that we just started with the students and I will give you more detail probably in the next, well, she has to finish by February, so it's not that far away. So uh, to conclude, um, this was a very, very quick overview. Uh, I just gave you a, a small, uh, I just, just chose a small uh, set of examples. I, I really wanted to, to, to stress a few key points about the performances of those models. I hope I managed. Uh, I think those are the parts that's, that stay, that are important at this point. And uh, luckily, we are moving beyond the stage, the step in which everybody is looking into cool new things to do, prototyping <coughs> something, new models. The community is now setting da settling down and trying to find a common standard to, to assess performance validation and common procedures, especially to integrate this in our simulation uh, workflow, which is, which is very important. I would also like to stress once more the importance of computing resources availability, and this can be described in many different ways. I would say that to make, it, to make a long story short, depending on how much computing power you have, of course, you can uh, change, then increase the size of the problem that you can uh, um, solve with this kind of approach. And of course, please uh, never forget that this is uh, a collaboration, uh, uh, the perfect field to improve collaboration between different communities, as I think this workshop uh, is showing. And Thanks, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Okay, uh, we are quite late, so just one quick question, if there is any urgent question. Yeah, so in your linear energy plots, I noticed that the scatter of the MCMC method was a lot bigger than the scatter of the GAN. And similarly, in this plot here, yeah. I'm noticing that the, the GAN is, is tailing off at the high frequency mm. and, yes. and the low frequency end. Um, now, that's fairly characteristic, that the, the distribution that's, that's starting from a Gaussian probably has difficulty f fitting long tails. Yeah. Th so uh, that would be a concern for me for the simulation, because you're not going to get the long tail rear events. Mm, okay, so let's... let's it's two different things. So it is true that g uh, guns will always be good. Well, you can actually see it better here. Um, you can see how the GAN, this is the pixel intensity plot, so the single cell energy in terms of physics, and you can see that in the GN4, the original distribution, there are drops. Because the network is smoothing out this behavior and it's not capable of actually reproducing it. It's kind of the same thing, because the network is learning a trend and then using it. Now, in this particular case, those are no physical problems that we have in GN4, but it's clear that you need to take into account this behavior. So if you have, if you have, um, use cases in which you need to reproduce uh, sharp cuts or very rare modes, then y you have to be careful. I agree with you, the, the gun is not going to, to, to solve those issues. There is no way around. Okay, so we need to move forward, so let's thank Sophie again.
Okay, so the last speaker before the coffee break is Xiao Gan Zhang, who is going to tell us about deep learning for uh, X-ray imaging. So, Ah, yeah, yeah, I got it. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I will uh, uh, talk about my uh, previous development of using deep learning for synchron X-ray imaging. Um, I'm Shogun, working in FS Patriot or DC. So, first, I will talk about uh, the previous development uh, using these two very basic models um, for synchron X-ray imaging. Uh, yeah, for the deep learning models, the two major uh, categories is first classification and the second uh, transformation. Um, all this just to uh, supervise learning. And uh, the idea is that uh, you, you have uh, different forms of data. You want to find the mapping between the, these data. And uh, then, uh, yeah, you use your new network as a kind of uh, complex formula to f uh, mapping the, uh, your data. So for the classification, you have uh, uh, image as input and uh, you use your network to sparse your data. And in the meanwhile, you uh, store uh, the uh, different features from the different scale. And at the end, you, you got uh, sparse digits uh, linked to uh, some labels as you expected. Uh, and uh, mm, for transformation, then you have two forms of the image. You want to find uh, the transformation rule between the, these images. So based on these two major uh, models, I uh, developed it for tomography rotation axis, uh, axis calibration and the diffraction pattern selection. Uh, for um, transformation, I developed for segmentation, low-dose image enhancement and uh, high uh, speed extra imaging or, and also uh, uh, super resolution. Uh, beyond this, I also have the other development on the way. And uh, yeah, all these things, you can find it uh, in, the, in my uh, GitHub repository. It's totally open source. And uh, uh, first, no, this is example of the tomography rotation axis calibration. Typically, for your tomography uh, measurement, uh, um, yeah, here uh, you have uh, your uh, sample or rotation and a center of rotation, and you can see that, that it is uh, always in the middle of your detector. Uh, then, in your the reconstruction uh, geometry, uh, with this kind of uh, data mesh, you can get a good reconstruction result. But uh, in reality, uh, especially in the nano state environment, it's not possible to always uh, align your rotation axis in the middle of the, the detector. For each different measurement, it's always slightly um, 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 uh, offset. So with this kind of uh, offset at the end, uh, if you consider it still uh, the, uh, the in the middle of in your mesh of the, the reconstruction, then you got this kind of fake reconstruction. You got this kind of shadows behind your uh, uh, true object. You, you got your object deformed. Uh, so uh, our idea is that to uh, you use the uh, yeah the, the very typical. Uh, CN classify to uh, figure out uh, whether uh, your reconstruction is well centered or uh, off centered. Because for this case, 
for any experience, uh, experienced um, scientist or even uh, without any experience or tomography, when you see the extraction, you obviously know whether it is uh, recent or not. But for the computer program, it's not that easy. Here, now after we trained this kind of uh, classifier to recognize whether it is recent or absent, and uh, then we can uh, use it to uh, uh, evaluate whether you, have, uh, you are using the right rotation axis or not. Then um, uh, for your reconstruction, you can uh, do a, s a series of reconstruction and uh, uh, use a different rotation axis at and uh, do this kind of automatic uh, program to uh, find the right rotation axis. Um, uh, yeah, with this algorithm, we compared with classical, uh, classical algorithms, and uh, uh, here you can see we've seen um, we, we got very high accuracy, ma maximum one pixel away from the ground truth, uh, and uh, for the uh, classical algorithms, uh, sometimes. Like uh, very popular uh, entropy-based method, sometimes you got 100 pixels away fr from the, the your ground truth. So uh, this is uh, one example, and uh, the second one is uh, using uh, the transformation model to do this uh, low-dose uh, uh, projection enhancement. So for those uh, the damage, it's quite common for uh, this nano uh, 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 X-ray uh, nano imaging and uh, uh, yeah when when your measurement goes down to uh, this very high resolution, your detector need to receive the enough the photons uh, to get uh, good enough uh, signal to noise ratio. Uh, yeah, but uh, when your detector receives this number of photons also. Uh, your sample uh, receive this kind of uh, number of photos at the end. Uh, for this biology sample, it's easy to uh, damage the sample. And uh, you cannot, uh, uh, especially for the tomography measurement, you cannot finish uh, the scan. So here, yeah, mm, we designed this kind of data st uh, strategy uh, and measurement st uh, strategy to the, uh, make uh, uh, the lotus measurement as good quality as a high dose measurement. So here for our measurement, first we do uh, the full angle short exposure uh, scan. And then uh, we choose uh, two angles to make the long exposure scan. And from the, uh, uh, these two angles of uh, two an uh, short exposure scan and long uh, exposure scan, we uh, trade the network to f find the mapping between this low quality of data to high quality of data. Then, uh, with the train network, we uh, do the prediction for the whole um, uh, set of the, um, uh, uh, short exposure scan, and at the end, we did this kind of enhancement. And uh, yes, th this is uh, the application for this case. Uh, this is uh, a slice of uh, mouse brain sample and uh, uh, the resolution is about uh, 50 uh, nanometer and uh, uh, if we uh, want to finish the scan we can the maximum uh, expert time for each uh, projection is uh, only two seconds and then uh, yeah the reconstruction is just totally noise and uh, mm, for a sufficient uh, uh, scanning time so uh, it's about uh, uh, at least 15 seconds, but y you, you will uh, burn your uh, sample and you cannot finish the scan. So uh, here, uh, with our uh, low-dose enhancement uh, data strategy, uh, we did the enhancement uh, for this two-second exposure measurement, and then we got th this result. And uh, this is compression with the median fit denoising and the TV denoising, you can see this is either too noisy or uh, this is uh, too smooth to um, uh, lose your uh, features. And uh, yes, we reduced the, the total uh, expert time from uh, three hours to 15 minutes. In meanwhile, we're capable to extract 
uh, th these features of the uh, axons and do uh, a fast uh, uh, segmentation. So uh, the other application for this uh, yeah, the image uh, transformation uh, model is segmentation. Is this is popular. I, I think the, uh, in past uh, three days uh, presentation, most people mentioned about uh, segmentation. And also in my past experience, most, most people uh, interested in this uh, segmentation. Even the, actually the technique behind it is very uh, simple and easy. Yes, uh, so we, we have this uh, uh, alloy cooper uh, aluminum uh, sample and uh, we uh, need to uh, segment out uh, these uh, particles in different phases, oh, only two phases here. Uh, and uh, uh, because the data quality in that uh, the resolution is not so good, uh, so the uh, segmentation can only be done manually uh, by a PhD student. So this is his um, one week work. And uh, after we use the CN, we got, uh, yeah, actually uh, prediction time only uh, 10 minutes and got the whole uh, 3D uh, segmentation. So um, they have uh, quite, quite similar uh, data set f uh, for 400 uh, measurements. And uh, if this PhD student keep doing this kind of work, yeah, 12 years without holiday. Uh, and then uh, the, the after using the, the same for segmentation, three days finished all the data set and uh, did uh, quantitative analysis. And then he got his PhD. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is uh, another application uh, for uh, data, uh, data transformation. So yeah, uh, this is the, the fluorescence measurement. You have uh, one the, the micrometer per pixel the scan step, and uh, we use CN to predict to 200 nanometer per pixel, and looks pretty. Everybody prefers this uh, smooth, high contrast, uh, noiseless uh, image, but this is, uh, can be, uh, this can be trusted, as uh, Jamie uh, on the first day uh, write this argument. Uh, yeah, here we have the ground truth. We have 200 nanometer uh, scan, and you can see a lot of similarities but still some differences, uh, like here and here. So, mm, uh, yeah, if you want to use it, uh, first you need to really, uh, you really need enough uh, training data set, means that your training uh, samples and features should be more than your measurement itself. But th that's a uh, uh, mission impossible. Uh, so, mm, I, I, I don't claim this is useless. Maybe in future someone cl uh, collect this kind of um, big data set and uh, do uh, nice training and uh, this would be a good way to saving uh, the measurement time. So uh, this is uh, another application to use GAN to do the super resolution. But uh, yeah, the major thing is not GAN, it's, how, uh, it's about the data strategy. Uh, this is uh, tomography scan. So for one projection, we uh, uh, do uh, both uh, high resolution, low resolution uh, scan. And then for the whole uh, tomography uh, uh, scan, we uh, only do the low resolution scan. At the end, we can get the tomography, uh, uh, the 3D uh, the tomography uh, the, the data set, and uh, also mm, uh, the data quality is good enough to see these features. Uh, yeah, the next is um, about uh, for the missing veg tomography reconstruction. The, yeah, the, for typical tomography the reconstruction, you need the, the full angle scan uh, to get 
a good quality to extraction. And if you miss some angle, then you got uh, the artifacts, as you see, and also the, uh, the structure is cannot be resolved. And uh, uh, we use GAN to uh, complete the missing part of, uh, of the sinogram and then do uh, the uh, reconstruction. And it uh, uh, works quite well, but uh, still, uh, this is supervised learning. And uh, for your real measurement, whether your uh, training data is uh, sufficient enough, that's difficult to uh, define. The, this application cases sh should be only limit to uh, specific uh, situations. And all the previous work I mentioned is supervised learning. Uh, so you have training data set, you train your uh, network, you get uh, the, the formula or your uh, data mapping, and then do you do the prediction. But uh, typically, we uh, in our uh, measurement, we always have uh, the physics model behind it. Why we don't uh, directly train from the model uh, uh, instead of uh, training from data? Then uh, the result should be more reliable because the model uh, mostly can constrain uh, your prediction uh, for uh, 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 right way. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, he, uh, this is a uh, very simple uh, uh, idea. I, I, you have input, you, you network to get, get output, uh, predict uh, output, and then you use a forward model to do the forward uh, propagation of the projection, and then uh, you, you, you get uh, forward prediction. Th this should be exactly the same as your uh, target, uh, as your the input. Uh, uh, measurement data. So uh, with this kind of minimization of the difference, uh, 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 feedback to the network to do this kind of uh, uh, inversion. And then uh, if you use uh, a random transform, then it's the uh, tomography extraction. If you use uh, for an application, then you do, basically you do the near field uh, phase retrieval, yeah. So uh, here uh, is uh, how we make it work. Mm. Um, here we use uh, GAN to the, uh, do this kind of iterations. Uh, this is example to do the tomography extraction. And uh, uh, we have input sinogram. We use generator to, uh, uh, to transform it as a, a candidate reconstruction. And then it do a random transform and uh, uh, to, to get a kind of uh, modeled uh, sinogram, and uh, this should be the same if you uh, did the right reconstruction. Uh, then we, uh, we use the discriminator to tell you whether uh, your reconstruction uh, is right or not from the, uh, this kind of iterations. And uh, yeah, uh, our application is here. Uh, we have this tomography measurement for the light particle, and uh, the part this is in situ measurement. The particle uh, placed in this in situ cell, you can see how thick of this uh, uh, cell. So at the end, you cannot do the full angle scan. Uh, we, we can only uh, get uh, zero to 70 degree of uh, tomography projections. Uh, I have at 51 tomography uh, projection, and uh, this is very on the sample uh, and uh, very imposed uh, the, uh, the data uh, inversion and uh, yes, uh, this this is our result to uh, 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 to use uh, our mm, uh, yes I I renamed it uh, recon GAN because uh, recently I just realized this, uh, this Tomo GAN name already registered by the other people uh, so I should uh, change the name uh, yes. Uh, yeah, mm, uh, the result is uh, quite nice uh, compared with uh, these traditional algorithms. Now this can uh, make uh, the result uh, to be uh, analyzed. And uh, here we scan, yeah, you just do uh, the pure uh, reconstruction without any training, and you, you can get this kind of very nice result. Uh, so this is uh, how it works for the uh, whole 3D data set. And uh, 
Um, yeah. Uh, after uh, the tomography application, uh, we also directly uh, changed uh, that red and transform as uh, the from now application did some simulation and uh, always get perfect uh, uh, result and also. Uh, beyond that, uh, like uh, for the uh, complex uh, uh, tomography the uh, models like uh, fluorescence tomography with uh, strong absorptions and uh, uh, you need uh, some advanced model for that, but uh, the inversion is not that easy and uh, for this case you, you can just uh, program uh, your forward model and uh, plug in the, to the uh, uh, to this uh, in words in the solve and then the it automatically solve your problem without modifying a any uh, parameters and uh, summary uh, basically uh, it, it did uh, three uh, tests yeah uh, I, I developed the, the, the this inverse solver uh, for tomography reconstruction and phase retrieval, and uh, also in previous we had uh, the, uh, plenty of uh, applications for uh, image classification and uh, image transformation. And uh, uh, based on these three uh, basic uh, image models, actually the application can be extended a lot. Uh, and uh, we are planning to make this kind of excellent uh, platform for <coughs> X-ray imaging with uh, uh, deep learning and uh, this project is uh, under development and uh, now it's uh, open source for many uh, applications uh, here but not everything uh, uploaded and uh, also welcome everybody to contribute something to it make it uh, uh, to be uh, um, uh, use the friendly touch and uh, yeah uh, finally uh, Acknowledgement, thanks to our colleagues from DC and also um, uh, my previous colleagues from uh, Argon and also uh, the our uh, colleagues from the user community or KIT and uh, uh, Arizona State University and uh, UC. And, uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, to not make a too short coffee, yes, one or two quick questions. So, in your reconstruction of zeolites mm -hmm. from the partial scan, um, can I just get a clarification for the filtered back prediction and other comparison methods you, that you use? Um, it seems, yes, this one. It seems to me that, that if, if you have only a partial scan, then you have only a partial matrix. And so yeah. you need to be sure that you use only the partial matrix with filtered back projection when you're reconstructing. Yeah. So if you use filtered back project that assumes that some of the scans are missing and they're zero, you'll yeah. get a huge number of artifacts. So it would be good just to try um, a big linear solve based only on the scans that you have and compare that with the GAN. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good su suggestion. Yeah, I would try it. Any other question? Okay, otherwise, let's, let's thank uh, again and again. Okay, and we come back at 11 to try to keep on time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow. Okay, and you will leave today? Or? Yeah, but we have time. I'm yeah, yeah. For the great, okay. great. Okay, great. Yeah. Later on, send the, the talk to the to the yeah, address. To the yeah, 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 I, I would upload it yeah. just because I don't have the Wi-Fi yeah. connection. Uh, well, yeah. right. As Paulo said, you cannot upload it directly. No, is that right? Uh, you don't have the permission. Maybe not. Huh? I don't know. So yes. So, so maybe on use. Could you send the PDF by mail <coughs> to the, uh, the address? Or yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it obtained as a
We had good security, but of course, I didn't have to do it about people bringing laptops which are infected laptops in and things like that. So, it's a case of hard work and all the rest of it. Does it work on going to China? Contacting the Russian or Chinese embassies by email is not a good idea. I don't have a business card on me. Uh, yeah, I have your name. Your name, your. Uh, yeah. I will send you an email. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>
I will be off the next two weeks for mission, mm -hmm. but then, then December I would be interested. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good thing. I mean, we need to you and also some other people. Whoever's interested, yeah, yeah. So yeah. to see whether, whether we can yeah. set up a little little test. Yes, yeah, I think they're coming to, yeah. to determine which are the most interesting established rules of the law and how, how to organize. Okay. Yeah, because there, there is this interest of it.
Because yeah, so, yeah, so far, so far I have to say our group is not profiting at all from scientific computing. Here's <laughs> the first time. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, yeah, this could be a really good opportunity. And, and it could be no. something which uh, you really, uh, how to say, make the ultimate experience of yeah. because essentially so far we are limited yeah. and we completely pull down by complexity and we feel getting tired of looking into complexity. It's, you know, the data contain information for 10 years of work, essentially, as they are measured, but nobody's able yeah, to yeah, have yeah. it. <laughs> So Mark, yeah. Huh? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think people this just me. Just want to see if that is that picking up my voice. It's not really picking up my voice. I'll, I'll move it a little closer. There we go. So I'm, 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 I'm down in the, uh, in the program, it says I'm professor. It's a nice promotion. <laughs> okay, we need to, to continue so people will, will come. Uh, yes, an announcement now we have two talks, then there will be a discussion uh, chaired by Tony High about uh, what have we learned from here, what, uh, what are the possibilities to continue, what kind of collaborations we can, we can establish. And then there will be a lunch buffet. For those of you who are in a hurry, you can get a lunch box uh, before leaving if you really need to, to hurry to the airport. And now, uh, just let's start with uh, Keith Butler. He was uh, at the STFC. And he's going to, to tell us about uh, deep learning for materials and science and the smart facility. So what you will explain us what this is. So th thank, thank you very much, Miguel. So first, I, I should apologize for totally changing the title of my talk. But I, I thought actually over the last couple of days, um, Certainly JN and uh, Mark gave a nice overview of a lot of the work we're doing at RAL. So I thought in, in, instead I'll do a bit of a, a deep dive into um, uh, some work we're doing with inelastic neutron scattering. Um, uh, and first of all, uh, apart from just organizing the, the conference, I'd really like to thank the, the organizers for the uh, promotion that I received in the, in the conference uh, pre proceedings. I was on down as Professor Keith Butler, so that was a nice surprise. And, um, well timed for a conference with my group leader and my department head in the audience, <laughs> so we, we can talk about pay afterwards. Um, but yeah, so without further ado, I'll, I'll talk about this, and um, I'm going to talk about uh, two examples of systems that we've been studying using um, deep learning um, that, that were studied previously using inelastic neutron scattering. And, and the first one is what, what my collaborators, um, uh, Toby and Doug, does as typically good data. And the second one is typical data. So um, let's first of all start by just taking a quick look at uh, what inelastic neutron scattering is. I'm sure a lot of people here know it, but, but just uh, in case not everyone does, it's, it's <coughs> worth reiterating. So in inelastic neutron scattering, what, what happens is that some of the energy from the incident neutrons is transferred into the sample. And um, you can measure how much energy is transferred to the sample. Uh, and th there are various types of event that, that can result in the transfer of energy. So you can get things like electronic transitions, so your neutron kicks electrons between energy levels, or it, it, can, it can couple into vibrational modes of your material, uh, rotational modes, and also um, in this region here where, where, I, where I have phonons, there, there's also magnons. Um, and magnons are actually what, what were of interest in the, the data sets that, that, that we were looking at. Um, 
So, so what exactly is a magnon? So a, a magnon is a, um, a, a magnetic excitation. So, so you might have a, some kind of ferromagnetic ground state where all your spins are aligned. Um, and for, for a high energy excitation, you could get a, a complete flipping of one of the spins. But, but a magnon is actually a, a relatively low energy excitation. So you just have one of the spins kind of moves slightly off axis, and then the rest of the spins in the material kind of respond to that and move slightly off their axes too, and you get these kind of wave patterns of spins formed throughout the material. And, and th that's, a, that's, that's what happens in, in a magnon. Um, so, so when neutrons hit samples and, and um, result in, in, in magnon excited states, you, you can measure signals that look something like this. So it's a spectroscopic technique, like I said. So you've got a, a, an energy range. So you get these energy range transfers, and you can measure at different points in, in Q space. And then by investigating these kind of um, patterns, you can work backwards and, and try and work out information about the magnetic structure of the material. So actually, um, Gareth gave a very nice introduction yesterday about how typically people would come along with, with some kind of model Hamiltonian and then try and fit parameters to that model Hamiltonian based on the, the experiments that they've done. So, so one of the ways that people try to compare between the theory and, and the experiments is by doing, of course, numerical models. So there's this uh, spin W code, which is, is able to simulate the kind of inelastic spectra that, that you get um, in, in these experiments. And then you essentially input to your spin W model something about the magnetic moments, the lattice, um, the types of interactions that you expect to have. And then it outputs the kind of spectrum you would expect to measure. And, and you go through an iterative process of trying to match the inputs to spin W to the, to the outputs and, and to the experimental data. Uh, and you can kind of numerically fit to experiment and, and then hopefully find the parameters of your Hamiltonian, etc. Now, so, so th that's actually quite a costly process because um, um, the, the it's, it's not possible to, to get a analytical gradients. So you basically have to numerically solve this and iteratively go through and work out which, uh, which spectrum match best to, to your spectrum. So we decided to see if, if we could use um, deep learning, um, uh, in particular convolutional network architectures, to, to, try, and, to try and tackle this problem. Uh, and this is the, the first system we're going to look at. So it's a rubidium manganese fluoride. Um, it's, it's quite a nice system. So you, you've basically got these 2D planes of magnetism within the material, which are well separated from each other. Uh, and it's, most of the magnetism is, is well described by linear spin wave theory. So, so it's, it's a nice system to kind of look at uh, just as a test and a proof of principle to see can we actually do something here. And also th there's plenty of experimental characterization around to compare to. The, the other thing that's nice about it is that we, we have a, a very nice clean data set that we, we can look at, which is not something that you always have. And there's also, this is going to become important in later contexts, so it, it's effectively just a single magnon. So th there's only a, a, single, a single band that you have to consider. So yeah, I I in, the, in the data processing, what you do is go, go through and um, first of all, remove the Bragg peaks from, from, the, from the data because the, the Bragg peaks would otherwise swamp all of the other signal that you're, that you're looking at. Um, then it's, it's a 2D map in QH and QK. And this is effectively the energy transfer integrated at each of the, the Q points in that space. And you can do that integration because it is just a, a single band, like I said. So then ca can we train a model to, to estimate the exchange constants given a certain Hamiltonian? Uh, and we, we just start with, with actually a very simple um, convolutional network. So you've got your convolutional layers here that extract the features from, from, the, from the image and then uh, some kind of densely connected layer that, that does function approximation. And we are basically cutting a long story short. We're, we're able to predict uh, exchange constants for the material, compare them to literature values, and, and, and it looks pretty good. So, so we're quite happy with that. So, so that's our, our very easy first case. That's our typically good data. And 
as a proof of principle, it shows, OK, we, we can probably do something using these convolutional networks. So now let's move on to the more typical system. So, th so this is a, a, a lot more subtlety involved. So, so this time we're looking at PCSMO, which is a, a type of uh, perovskite structure with uh, mixed A sites. And you've got uh, magnetic coupling, in this time, in all three directions. And actually, in this case, we're not so much interested in learning the parameters of a Hamiltonian as trying to work out which from a certain selection of Hamiltonians best describes that data. So, so when I say that, it's working out what kind of spin patterns could be responsible for the data that you get. And there, there are, um, again, this, is, this, is, this has been solved. So it was, it's kind of just something of seeing, can we use the neural network to, to go and, and, um, and, and look at this. Um, so you've got three competing models. So you've got the, um, the good enough model, of course, topical with uh, John Goodenough winning a Nobel Prize just a couple of weeks ago. L not for his work on magnetism, it's of course, his, for his, his work on batteries. But you know, there could be a second Nobel Prize. Um, uh, th there's, there are also some competing models, a, a Zener, Zener model and a, 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 a Dimer model. and. Um, um, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say that the good enough model is actually the correct, the correct one here. I mean, you don't, you don't win the Nobel Prize for coming up with incorrect models, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I take back that comment. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so this is kind of how how it was solved in the first case. So. It's kind of finding a needle in a haystack to, to try and discriminate between these models. So this is somewhat like what your collected experimental data looks like. So uh, actually, it's, it's probably more in, in three, three Q dimensions. And then you've got also got an energy dimension. Uh, uh, and, and effectively, what, what the scientists have done is to, to go through and very carefully slice through the energy space and Q space and compare the, the data to simulations of those slices in energy in Q space uh, and, and try and from that tease out which of the models actually ex explains the data best. Uh, and and this, this is effectively the, the slice in Q space uh, and energy space that they arrived upon. And you can see these kind of um, points of high density here. Uh, and, and they match up with, with the good enough model here, whereas these two different models you have um, the, the high density points at different places in space, and that's the kind of that's the smoking gun that allowed for discrimination between th the two models. But the, th that's obviously incredibly tedious, and incredibly difficult, uh, and I, I think to Toby wouldn't mind me saying slightly serendipitous to 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 to, to realise that, that that's where you, you find it in, in the. It's actually when I was writing this up <laughs> that I discovered a small problem in uh, the construction of a figure that actually sent me down that direction. <laughs> we had at that point concluded that we didn't know which model it was. So, so, so absolutely serendipitous. So, so, so I, is there some way that we can, we can use um, machine learning and neural networks not just to help us discriminate, but to, to tell us where we might look in our experimental data if we want to make these discriminations? Um, so first of all, I'll talk a little bit about the data. So I said this is more typical data as opposed to typically good data. So, so there's a couple of... Um, things that make it more <coughs> difficult to deal with than the, the, the rubidium case that I showed previously, the rubidium manganese fluoride. So it's a noisier data set um, for several reasons. Um, one of those reasons being the presence of phonons. And, and for people who study phonons, I'm sure they'll say the magnons are just noise. And for people who study magnons, the phonons are just noise. But you know, regardless of that, there, there's a signal in there that's obscuring the kind of signal that, that you want to look at. The other thing is that um, while I said the the, the first case that we looked at had just a single kind of um, energy band. Um, th there are actually several branches of, of magnons in, in, this, um, in this system. So yeah, we, we have multiple bands in the spectrum. How do we deal with them? So in, in the 214 case, we could kind of collapse down into this, this 2D map. And you don't lose any information by doing that. And you can feed that into your network. In, in this case, actually, if you collapse it down, to a 2D map like that and integrate it across energy, of course, you'd integrate across several bands. And by doing that, you lose information. So, so we have to think about that. So one way you could do that, of course, is, is using uh, 3D 
um, convolutional networks. In fact, what we did instead was to just kind of take energy slices, much like the way people do when they're analyzing these uh, spectra. So we took energy slices and, and stacked them together, and, and you make a, a new 2D image in, in that way. Um, yeah, so, so then we, we kind of trained up some, some models with that. So the, these are just um, uh, neural networks that, that then discriminate whether it's uh, one model or the other. And, and if we feed it some nice simulated data, which is the good enough model, it comes out and predicts it's a good enough model. That's nice. OK, great. So our network that's trained on simulated data can make the correct prediction on simulated data. That's a decent start. But what we really want to do is, is to make that, that prediction on the experimental data. And um, this, the second problem we're suffering here is the, the, the noise in, in, the, in the spectrum. So, so there, there's a very large contribution from phonons in, in these spectra. Uh, and you can see that that kind of obfuscates the, some of the magnons that you see kind of coming up here. But that signal is, is kind of very much lost because of the intensity down here at, at low energies. So we'd like to remove this if at all possible. So first of all, the first thing I did was, was to try just feeding the spectrum with that noise into this um, neural network, which tells us which model it thinks explains that data. And, and it predicts it incorrectly. So not, not really surprising. And you, you can see these, these regions of, um, of, of the phonons down here at low energy again. And that's what's kind of really confusing the network. So we've, we've gone and um, actually trained an, an autoencoder to, to denoise the, the, the signal. So we, we trained the autoencoder on um, a training set of simulated magnon spectra. So a whole range of magnon spectra from all of the different models across different parameter ranges. And then, yeah, so this effectively learns, as we've heard a few times about um, autoencoders, so it learns some kind of compressed representation of, of the data. And then we, we can actually go and pass the experimental data through the magnon or through the autoencoder. Uh, and then we get some kind of cleaned up signal that's, that's trying to pick out the magnons uh, at the other side. And it, it looks a lot more similar to the, the simulated spectra than, than, than the original experimental one, I think. And actually, when we feed that into our, um, our um, network to predict which model explains that data, we get the correct answer. So we, we get to the good enough um, model. So again, that's quite nice. But, but we'd actually, so, so one of the, when you work with scientists, they want to know why things happen, right? Uh, I mean, if you're training neural networks to, to decide where to open your next pizza parlor, people maybe don't, don't care so much about why it says that. But if you're working with scientists, they tend to care an awful lot about, about why things happen. And, and of course, when you use classical models, they're, they're, they're relatively easy to interpret. But from deep neural networks, they, they've certainly got a reputation as a black box. And, and we'd like to look inside that and see why has it, it come to that solution. So, um, and, and there are a num number of reasons um, why, why it's a good idea to make models interpretable. So of course, if your model's not working well, if it's interpretable, then that helps you in debugging, realizing what's gone wrong. When your model is working well at, at human levels of uh, performance, then it helps you to increase confidence and it helps you to build up user confidence in the models. And, and then kind of a, a bit of a holy grail, I guess, is, is if your model is performing at superhuman levels, then you can actually interrogate the model and see, well, well why is it performing so well? What has it learned that we didn't know beforehand? So you might actually be able to learn something by interrogating the model. So, so what we've used to... Um, look at, at, at the model and, and try and understand why it's made the classifications is something called class activation maps. So, so we had a, a nice talk yesterday where, where we were showing class activation maps being used on some uh, free electron laser data. So, so these class activation maps, essentially what they do is they, they take your image um, and your image has been classified as, in this case, brushing teeth. And it, it gives you a heat map that tells you what part of that image is it that, that, that told me that this is brushing teeth or cutting trees. And um, this is kind of the early implementation of class activation maps, which is what we used in the first case. Uh, and, and this is kind of how they work. So what you do is after the, the convolutional layers in your network, after the final convolutional layer, you, you do um, a, a, a global average pooling of, of the filters in that final convolutional layer. 
and then you feed them into your, um, your, your classification function. Uh, what that allows you to do, so this is just the kind of the mathematics behind how it works. So as I said, you, you, take, your, you take your filters, um, you take their global averages, so that gives you this, this large F, so that's the global averages of all the filters K. These are your classes, so S are the different classes, and you, you can get the weight or the, the, um, the weight ascribed to different classes by just summing the weights by uh, these global averages F. So actually if you work that backwards, you can put in this spatially resolved F for the large F, uh, and you get your, your classes through that. And then you, you can actually look at, on the map, which parts are, are contributing to that classification by simply removing the summation over, over the um, X and Y coordinates. Uh, and that gives you your class activation map for the, the final layer of your, your convolutional network. And what you can do then is effectively upsample that map to the, the, the original image size, and it tells you where in the original image was leading to that, that classification. So, so we, we've gone and, and used these class activation maps on, on the network that we, we trained to discriminate between the different models to see which parts of the spectrum that we fed it are telling it that it's the good enough model as opposed to any other model. And you can see some, some clear hotspots being highlighted here in these energy slices and these regions of Q space. And what, what's really nice is then if we go back and compare this to the original experimental paper, um, so th this is, this is from, from Toby's original work. Um, so I should say each of these slices here is kind of equivalent to this region of Q space here. And actually, if you, you compare the energy slices that were taken here, they, they also match very nicely. Uh, in fact, almost exactly, they cover the energy range that was also used in the original paper to classify um, this as a good enough model. So, so, so we're able to, by using this, actually identify the regions in Q and energy space that, that, that led to that, um, that, 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 that classification. And, and that's, that's quite nice because, well, for, for one thing, it can tell you, if, if you've got all this data, where should you look in your data to, to try and make these um, kind of discriminations? But it could, it could also help you if you were trying to design an experiment and y y you have the ability to look in different regions of Q space. Um, what regions do you want to look in to make those classifications? <laughs> and, and actually, by flipping these um, class activation maps on their head, you can also ask the question of, what, what parts of the image are making you uncertain about a classification? So, so your, you, your model could be telling you something and you can kind of look at it and say, well, what's making you uncertain about that? And you might want to go and collect more data in that region to you know, um, satisfy yourself that, that things are actually OK. So OK, in, in summary, um, inelastic neutron scattering requires complex data analysis. I think um, combining physics models with uh, neural networks is, is uh, is a powerful way of uh, interpreting these spectra. Under understanding networks is a good idea in general, and um, it can help you to provide guidance on how to sample experimental space. Um, I'd like to, to thank a few people. So we get our funding, obviously, from STFC and also some from the ATI. Uh, people in the SciML group, so Rebecca, Tony, JN, Sam, Patrick, and also um, Duck and Toby, who, who, who've helped a lot from ISIS with with walking me through this data and understanding the problems. Um, and I, I thought I'd leave this thought because it's, it's been a, a long couple of days of you know, CNNs and GANs and autoencoders, and, and people are confused by, by the language. This is a, a nice piece of t Twitter wisdom um, that, that I came across just the other day, that uh, when we apply for funding, it's AI. When we, do the, when we do the hiring, it's machine learning. And when we do the work, it's logistic regression. So uh, <laughs> with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Keith. There is one question over there. Hello. Um, so a few things. Um, one is um, I like the idea of using um, you, you of uh, trying to look where you f can distinguish between the models a priori, and I'm curious how far along you've thought about that. Um, and then the question part is. Um, uh, once you did your denoising, did you think about just using Bayes factors to do classic, well, classical Bayesian model selection? Uh, so, 
to answer the first one about how far how far along have we come with with trying to guide the experiments a priori um, not not a huge difference so we've we've got this this example here um, what what you'd really have to do is is find some way of incentivizing people to do these kind of analyses before they come and do their their neutron experiments so I, I think there's there's something in that that you have to kind of convince people who are coming to do experiments that this is a good idea to do this kind of thing. Um, for the denoising, um, we tried a couple of approaches. I, I, I have to say I haven't tried Bayesian approaches to the denoising. Um, no, not to the denoising, but you do this oh, so denoising. Oh, model selection. Oh, okay. Yeah. So do the model selection after the denoising. I mean, the denoising is actually rather nice because then you don't have to model the phonons and maybe you can't subtract them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so you could think about trying a, a Bayesian model selection. Yeah, that's not, not something we looked at. But, but yeah, because I don't think many people do this in the field. You know, I they mean, go and say, this looks pretty okay, good uh, enough. Uh, um, yeah, I think particularly in these things where, where the Hamiltonians can start getting pr pretty hairy and complex. Um, Something that kind of weights you towards simplicity might might be a, an interesting approach to take. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe maybe stare at base factors would be my advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're having problems with phonons and magnons kind of interfering. How sure are you that the, the phonons and magnons are actually separate in, in these materials, which are highly magnetic? Um. So the phonons and magnons mean so, so. So this is electron phonon coupling yeah. kind of situations you'd be worrying about. Well, uh, I, I'll, I, I will defer to, to Toby on, on that one. Um. Right. So um, you know, the high energy phonons, um, uh, we did the best subtraction that we could uh, do by uh, looking at uh, high momentum scattering, which is where the phonon cross-section is large and the magnon cross-section is small, um, at equivalent symmetry equivalent Q points. So we've done the best that we ca could there. So the largely what we end up doing is having vastly enhanced error bars on the data there. So it's, it's just no it, it's, it's noisy where there's the subtraction, plus there's some systematic um, under or over subtraction. The low energy is much more of a problem because the phonons are simply dominating down there. And so that's really what the key was that, that, that Keith was talking about at the low energies. That's, you know, the cross section for phonons just simply explodes. Um, when it comes to magnon phonons uh, coupling, for example, well, you know, that's part of why we want to know. Um, what was it that was in the, the, the net that made it choose one model or the other because that will start, that will start to give us some sorts of hints because you know, if it's in certain energy regimes at certain Q points, we will know that, oh, that's where the magnons and the phonons are crossing and maybe that could be putting us off. So that's why it's so important to actually get into, into, the, into the, lift the lid on the, mod, on, on the net and actually find out what is it that's made it choose what it has. So that's why we've put quite a lot of effort into that side of the uh, project. Yeah, so the follow-up to that, which I was kind of planned for when I asked the question, is, okay, so um, you've got all your, your classes for different models, but shouldn't you also have a class for, you know, there's unknown physics of phonons and magnons here, yeah, which we, we need. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I, I often go to see Keith, and in 30 seconds throwaway comments, I'm asking him to do a six-month piece of work, and that's that's one of them. <laughs> no, they, no, you, you really hit it there, yeah. A to-do list. Or you could just uh, try four of the experiments. This was actually really hard. I mean, what? <laughs> For aficionados, this material has uh, four equivalent twins where we don't know what the population density, and that was actually part of the uh, disentangling of what's going on inside this problem. So, so it's yeah, where, where the count rate is to first order zero. I mean, that's the problem. We, we had the world's largest sample of this, and it was something like one gram. So. Okay, there are no more questions. We thank Keith again. Last speaker is Mario Rettigan from the SRF, who's going to tell us about uh, deep learning for spectroscopy. So, Marius.
so good morning. It's okay, right? So good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Amarius Retigan. I work here in the Electronic Structure and Magnetism and Dynamics group. And today I just want to, to share with you a few thoughts on, on how machine learning is used actually for spectroscopy and how we can get from the spectra to, to, to learn something about the atomic structures. Um, what you have here is a representation of the ESRF and annotated along the, around the, um, the storage ring, you have uh, all the beam lines that do spectroscopy at ESRF. And uh, here you can see that it's quite an extensive list. So uh, spectroscopy is well represented in the life of, uh, of the synchrotron. Uh, these beam lines, they do a lot of, uh, they are, um, they do a lot of different techniques uh, of spectroscopy, ranging from X-ray absorption, emission, scattering, uh, inelastic or Raman scattering, and also XMCD um, circular dichroism. So these, uh, what the type of experiments that you can find of these beam lines are rather unique, and uh, I'm just going to show you a few examples <coughs> of uh, of this. And uh, I will start with the, probably the most impressive machine that we actually have here on site that does, uh, is the Ricks spectrometer from the ID32 beamline. And this, uh, this instrument is actually used to do low energy excitation in, in different type of materials. And this is a, a study that deals with uh, copper oxide sub, uh, super, uh, superconductors. Um, equally uh, impressive is the, the Raman spectrometer on ID20 where you was used uh, in a recent study to, to study the, um, the, the properties of silicon dioxide uh, close to the, the pressure that you can have in the earth mantle. And finally, a third example is, is the X-ray uh, emission spectrometer that you have on ID26. This has, been, has a long history of being used to study the electronic structure of very complex biomolecular system. And again, an example here is a uh, a study where they use X-ray emission spectroscopy to, to get insights into the, the spin of iron in, uh, in heme proteins that are responsible for oxygen transport. I'm saying to you all this just to, 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 to let you know and to, to acknowledge the fact that the experiments that are, are taking place on some of these spin lines are rather unique and they, have, they study very unique uh, um, uh, problems and uh, it's difficult uh, and for the moment, the, the, the community has not, the machine learning community has not reached into these uh, into these uh, problems. Instead, uh, you might have noticed that among the techniques that uh, that are represented the SRF, the X-ray absorption technique is almost uh, is available in the large majority of the of the beam lines here. So this is not a surprise because X-ray absorption technique has become the workhorse of uh, spectroscopic techniques. So X-ray absorption is readily available and uh, it's, it's applicable to a wide range of sample and you can, uh, it's applicable also to in situ and operando condition, very harsh environments. What makes this type of techniques very interesting to, uh, to the experimentalist is that it's sensitive to the local coordination environment of the, of the, of the material. Uh, this is a typical uh, X-ray uh, absorption spectrum for an iron compound. You, you saw a little bit of this yesterday with a different region corresponding to different type of excitations that you can, you can measure. Now the way uh, to interpret uh, such uh, spectra is to measure uh, sample uh, materials and to compare uh, afterwards, uh, after the measurement, to compare uh, your unknown, let's say, sample with uh, reference compounds. So it would be interesting to, to have something like uh, machine learning techniques to, to do this uh, extraction of uh, structured information directly from the, the spectrum. So you could think that uh, the best way to, to actually train such a network is to use experimental data because that's what you're trying to reproduce. And there are already uh, a number of, uh, of databases online that uh, gather uh, experimental spectra. You have here one in US and in Europe. The problem with using uh, experimental data is that uh, you have a few limitations. First of all, it's only available for some of the, the materials. It's, uh, it's a number that is way uh, uh, inferior to what you actually need to train an editor to do some, some predictions. 
In addition, you only have, uh, if you want to do correlation between uh, spectrum and structure, you can only include, of course, those, um, those uh, spectra that you have a known and well-characterized structure. And something that is maybe less uh, evident is that uh, what you have uh, usually, or you can have very often in, in, in measured spectra, is uh, contribution from different sites. So take, for example, something like hematite, where you can have iron in different coordination environments. So what you get uh, when, you, when you measure that spectrum, you're going to have an average over the whole sample. So this pretty much is a, is a no-go scenario. So the next best thing you can do is to use the theoretical spectroscopy to, to build your, your data set of, um, of uh, training, to use for training. Uh, computer codes have been used, have a long history, uh, using computer codes has a long history in interpreting this X-ray um, X-ray spectra and the way uh, it goes is that um, people do this type of calculation in their own labs and they try using this calculation to infer something from, uh, for the, st for infer something uh, regarding the structure of the material. But with the advent of all this big data and uh, the need for a larger, um, larger uh, spread of, um, of uh, uh, theoretical simulation, it's not uh, very uh, surprising that something like material project has uh, come uh, to life a few years ago. This gathers uh, theoretical calculation on, on almost all the periodic table and they have a relatively easy to use public API when you can use to retrieve atomic coordinates, band structure, and X-ray absorption spectra. And this is a very recent addition. So you can, you have actually the possibility to connect the X-ray spectra with the, something related to the atomic structure. Now how is this um, project being used? Um, here is an example uh, of trying to identify the local coordination in, in uh, 3D transition metal based on the X-ray absorption spectrum. You have uh, mostly uh, three important classes. Uh, in this case, you have um, tetrahedral uh, five coordinate and six coordinated uh, um, um, type of structure. And if you go to an expert that is used to doing such type of measurements, they're going to tell you that a way to distinguish between the different uh, local coordination environment is just to look at this pre-edge, so-called pre-edge region. This is because uh, with the reduction of symmetry, you're going to have changes in intensity and changes in the structure of that uh, region. Now, compared to what I've seen the last uh, few days here, uh, this type of uh, neural network is uh, very, probably very simple. Um, and uh, this is uh, what was used to actually uh, do the discrimination. So you have as input the, the spectrum here. They had an optional uh, convolutional array, a, a number of three layers, fully connected, and finally with the soft max activation function at the end. So here is a, just a list, uh, is it, sorry, this is just a table of all the, the number of spectra they had for a different absorbers, then the, the type of um, local coordination environment that added up to something like 18,000 spectra in the end, which were augmented by shifting them by uh, plus or minus one EV on the energy axis. Now, I just want to, to show you that actually just by plotting all the spectra from a different families for a given absorber, you can actually uh, distinguish the, the differences in the pre-edge region between the classes. This in blue is a four coordinated uh, sam uh, sample. So what you actually have is that the, the, for the first, uh, for the early transition metals, the pre edge does indeed provide with uh, rich information about the local uh, coordination environment, but this is not the case for the for the late transition metals. And uh, by doing some principal component analysis, um, it was shown that actually even in the post edge, edge, uh, post uh, edge region, a region that people usually do not pay attention to do this type of discrimination, there is enough structure, uh, enough information to actually distinguish between the different classes. So all this data was fed into the, to the, the simple networks that I've shown before. And uh, the, um, the results are that using or not using the convolutional layer uh, gives pretty much the same, uh, the same F1 score, um, average F1 score. So this is when the full spectrum is used and that's basically the gray bar plus the color bar. 
A very interesting result was that if you use only the, the pre-edge region, um, the, convolution, uh, the, the, the network that had a convolution layer uh, to start uh, outperforms the multi-layer perceptron only. But more surprisingly was that for the late transition metals, for those spectra which lack, fe lack features in the pre-edge region, the the, the, the F1 score was drastically reduced. So basically you have to look at, the, for example, this iron and cobalt. If you look at the five coordinated samples, you have a, a score which is uh, way below 0 0.2 and uh, way below what was achieved by including also the, the, f including the full spectrum. So this is the type of, this is the state of the art in terms of uh, uh, machine learning uh, application to, to spectroscopy simulation, to spectroscopy uh, techniques, to spectroscopic techniques. So what do we do, what do you do when you do not have uh, a, a data set or you're interested in other type of absorbers that are not present in the, the materials project? So I'm going to show you a simple example or, or how, where you, how you can do correlation between spectrum and structure for, for simple water molecules. This is the, uh, uh, an experimental spectrum and a simulated spectrum. And uh, the, the features that you see in the, in the spectrum actually correspond to, to transition from some occupied orbitals to uh, some unoccupied high energy orbitals. Now because these uh, orbitals are polarized towards the, the, the hydrogen atoms, it's very natural to expect that as you change the structure, you, you actually change the, the position of these peaks and their intensity. So as I said, if you do not have the structure, what you can do, if you do not have a large uh, number of materials, you do molecular dynamic simulation. And this is uh, raw data that uh, Christoph Saleh was uh, nice enough to, 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 to give me, to provide me. And uh, he did a, number, a large number of independent ab initio molecular dynamic simulation. And for each of these molecular dynamic simulation, you can extract uh, uh, the structure of a large number of water molecules and calculate for uh, these 10,000 water molecules, calculate the X-ray absorption spectrum. And here you have the average spectrum in a darker color and, um, uh, and uh, span, uh, span ar around it you have the, the, the the other spectrum, so you can see that you can have a clear um, uh, variation in intensity and also in peak position. Uh, this is just to show you that during, uh, so there are not that many structural parameters that we can uh, actually look for in a water molecule. You have basically two bond distances and an angle. And this is the distribution of the angles and uh, with, um, with a somewhat uh, large standard deviation uh, compared to um, to the distribution of the of the bond uh, of the distribution obtained for the bond distances. Um, in line with what uh, was uh, um, used to do the classification problem, this is a, for this type of uh, regression. I used a very simple, by the standards of the, what I've seen in the last few days here, uh, network that actually is basically textbook uh, network. And uh, it's, it's very simple. Uh, the optimization of such a network can be easily done on a personal computer without, uh, without any issue. So what, we can, uh, what type of information we can get from this? Um, so the, the predictions on the observed data, there is a, they have, a, aside from a few outliers, there is a small error in the values that are predicted for the angles and the similar uh, type of value uh, of the root mean square error uh, in the case of the, the bond distances. Um, now, uh, a paper, uh, uh, rather, a rather recent paper, showed that instead of using the full spectrum and because they were not having machine learning um, techniques, uh, they would, did not use machine learning techniques in this paper, uh, it was to use instead the integrated intensity of the spectrum to get some correlations between the, um, between the, the features, the spectral feature and the, the structural feature. So just to show you uh, that I'm coming back to the, the, um, the prediction ob obtained for the, um, using the full spectrum. And somewhat not surprisingly, I would say, the prediction using the only the region of interest integrals span a larger error and have a root mean square error of about an order of magnitude uh, larger. So with this, I just want to, just want to conclude that 
compared with all the complex applications that I've seen in the, last, uh, in the last days in spectroscopy, the requirement is very low. And uh, even with simple uh, machine learning models, we can uh, do a lot uh, in terms of um, extracting structural information from, the, from this uh, X-ray absorption spectra. Um, for the moment, the training, the neural networks using theoretical spectra is performed because of the, um, oh, sorry, training the, using theoretical spectra is, is preferred over the using experimental data because of the reason that I, I mentioned before. However, I should stress here that uh, theory in uh, theoretical spectra are not without caveats because you rely a lot on the, on the fact that the model is going to provide you the, uh, with a good agreement between the, the experiment and the theory. There are some uh, ideas on how to, to go uh, around fixing this. Of course, the most obvious thing is to just increase the theoretical level. And in, in, theoret in such calculation, you can easily go from a few minutes to actually a few hours or even a few days of calculation. Uh, another thing that was suggested is to use uh, some type of hybrid, um, uh, hybrid data set to do the training. So you combine a theoretical calculation and you, do, you, you also include experimental data or do transfer learning in, in, in to, to only optimize a few parts of the, of the network to on experimental data. So uh, an important thing is that uh, the neural networks can actually, with the, with, the, with the points highlighted before, they can predict the coordination number quite accurately. And I think this is important because uh, this is the type of information that people look for when they are doing this type of experiment. So it's very easy to, to maybe imagine experiments with high throughput where these measure, this spectra measure fast and the only thing that you're actually interested in is just to get some information about how the local environment changes during the reaction, how changes during a catalysis, or how the size of a nanoparticle changes during the, um, the catalytic process. So, and the last point, uh, if you do not have, uh, or if your system um, is not covered by the, the such data, online databases like Material uh, Studio, uh, Materials Project, sorry, uh, you can actually use a very, uh, you can use molecular dynamic simulation to, 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 to build enough of a training set to actually do the prediction that you're interested in. And with this, I would like to thank you and uh, I would be happy to take your questions. <laughs> I don't. So, so <laughs> you're, you're. Yeah. Um, I'll speak loud. Um, so, so it's it's a question about these characterizing the metal centers at the start. So yeah. that's trained on examples of each metal center. What what happens if there's a material with a mixture of different centers? Can, can it handle that, or does it have to be explicitly trained to? Uh, and, and actually, the, the spectra that you're measuring, because you're measuring X-ray spectroscopy, right? You're going to be element um, selective. So what you're going to get is going to be an, a spectrum that corresponds specific to an element. So you hit at a certain range. Exactly. You, 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 you even it's not even a question of range. It's a question of energy. Because like uh, you have uh, iron or you can have cobalt, and they're not going to ha they're going to have the spectra different parts of the energetic spectrum. Okay. Some <coughs> other question. Uh, well, I have one question. I mean, you just talk about water and talking about liquids, you say coordination number, well, it's an important quantity, but in a liquid, I guess it's less <coughs> well defined in some systems. I mean, really you de depends how you define the first coordination layer. How do you handle this? The, uh, the coordination of the, the surrounding water molecules? Or yeah, in the sense <coughs> I mean, there will be so not a single distance. <coughs> I mean, it's <laughs> yes, in, in, indeed. I mean, these models can actually maybe be used uh, better to study s ice forms of waters where you have a clear coordination number and it's, it's more well defined than in the case of a liquid. Uh, but I agree with you that in, in the case, and also these are just simple parameters that I used here, the local uh, geometry of a water molecule. Of course, when you're trying to study something such complex as water, you have to think about uh, like uh, interaction with the different water molecules, like diadora angles, uh, distance between the neighbors, and stuff like that, as you say. Okay, there are no more questions. 
then we thank Marius again. As well as all the speakers of this morning. And now in the program we have a discussion session, so I handle this to Tony. And we all I call also Very good. To so we're going to rearrange slightly to get our, our distinguished panel up. And I've got uh, a slide just to tell you who the panel is. But I know you've been waiting for the highlight of the conference, the panel session. So, uh, yes, that's correct. We need six. So, if the panel members could come up. Jamie's disappeared, but he's coming back, I hope. Uh, can I find that there, there was a, some slides yeah. in here? Yeah. Just very short, the final round table. That's it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Michael. Okay, so, um, thank you, Daniel. Yes, I assumed you were in the audience somewhere. <laughs> And, and Jamie will come at some point. Okay, so um, here is our, our distinguished panel. And uh, what I've asked them to do is to set the scene by saying a, a maximum, a, a short verbal statement about what they see as the key issues at the meeting and, and where they think we should go next and what we've learned and so on. And I also included... Um, some, some possible questions which they can see behind them, <laughs> if they look, uh, about uh, what we might do in the future, promising applications, what generic tools and so on. But there are many more questions and the, and the real highlight of this is of course the discussion with, with, with you guys. So what we're going to do is, is start with just a quick statement from each of them uh, uh, and I'll cut them off if they go on too long. So I will hand the microphone over to Jamie. No, no, I just got here. Go to the other end. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, off you go. Uh, yeah, so, I should, I should. so introduce yourself here. Yeah. yeah, I should introduce myself. I, I, I'm John Taylor. I work for the... Uh, I don't think you can hear me. Is it not working? No. Try, try, try this one. I think you just need to hold it much closer to your mouth, John. It's got a red light. This one has a green. This has a green light. Oh yes, really good. So yeah, my, uh, my, my name is Jonathan Taylor. Uh, I work for the European Spallation Source. I'm the head of the uh, Data Management and Software Centre there, which is uh, the Scientific Computing uh, Division of that organisation. Uh, so yes, why am I on this panel? Because I'm not a uh, an AI, machine learning, deep learning expert. Far from it. Uh, we did uh, some months ago organise a similar uh, meeting to this one in Copenhagen. Uh, which was a collaborative effort between ESS and uh, the University of Copenhagen, KU. Uh, in there, they have the uh, Niels Bohr Institute there and also uh, the uh, Scientific Computing or the, the Computer Science Department, DECU. So we organized a discussion about where we could put or where we should put or how we should put uh, AI technologies, and I use AI in some kind of, you know, all, all of the things that we've learned or been discussing about the last couple of days into the context of neutron scattering, uh, specifically neutron scattering for the European Spallation Source, but, but more generally. So that was a very, a very interesting uh, meeting. It was done in a slightly different way to this one, uh, a bit more like the BES meeting that was organized in, in, uh, in the US uh, some, somewhat ago, where we had some uh, pr keynote presentations and uh, then some very focused discussions about how how we could go, and there's two ways of doing it, and this is one way, and that was another way, and I think, uh, looking at what happened, we have ended up in some kind of uh, uh, local minima, understanding what we can do and what we cannot do. So, Tony has suggested I have to make some sage uh, remarks about all of this, and this any, any and and I guess the, the the most important thing that we learn in Copenhagen, and I think that we probably learn here, is that w everybody needs to speak at least a similar language. So the people that do scattering at large scale research infrastructures, or, well, and I say scattering uh, just because, because that's a catch-all term, uh, but people that do experimental methods at those places need to understand the methods that the uh, mathematicians and statisticians use to leverage this technology for, for a benefit, and vice versa. So some common lexicon is, is required and meetings like this and the meeting that we had go some way to, I think, be, be very helpful in, the, in that regard. Uh, moreover, the, the real important thing is that what we've seen is that there's a lot of 
very interesting work that's been done, and very valuable work that's been done with what I would class, because I'm, I'm somehow a software developer, uh, single developer projects. So small groups of people getting together, trying to crack a single problem. And you can go some way down that line, and in some things it's very, very effective. And I guess it's very, 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 very effective in the areas where, where, this, where this technology is already very, very well mature. So in, in imaging, uh, classification, quantification, uh, and denoising, I think there's, there's immediate leverage that this com our community, my community, can, can benefit from. Going beyond that to more predictive, you know, the smart lab, where you say, computer, please make this work, or computer, what, why, why, is, why is this peak here, why is that peak there? Then there's considerably more work that's needed to, to get to some, uh, well, to go down that track. And that, that's, I think, probably beyond single developer projects. That needs, a, that needs a big consortium, a big collaboration, and that needs, that, that needs to happen. That, that requires funding. Uh, what is important, though, of course, is that that collaboration involves the, all of the experts, not just the experts in scattering, but also the experts in the, in the technology in, 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 in applied mathematics, st statistics, and, and already the state of the art, which is obviously a, a very big state of the art for, for, for AI. When I say AI, I mean everything that we've talked about. So yeah, that's where, that's where I'd end. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And I would include computer scientists too, by the way. Yeah. Melanie. Uh, hello, yes, yeah, so um, I got on that panel by a bit of surprise this morning, thanks Tony. <laughs> um, so I'm actually a postdoc at VMXM that is part of the um, MX village at Diamond. Uh, Diamond itself is located on the same campus as ISIS, and um, so our neutron source and um, SDFC, well, a lot other facilities of SDFC and uh, the scientific computing department are part of it. And um, so we are a bit separated, but try to collaborate where we can. And um, so from the MX point of view, um, I think our main issue and why we would like to use uh, machine learning is basically we go very much into automation. Um, our data acquisition is so fast that in real time, as a human being, you can't actually analyze the data. So you need some form of machine to assist you. Um, as, as I mentioned in my talk uh, two days ago, so uh, standard data collections are usually under a minute, so you get a full um, view on your sample within under a minute, and the data analysis on um, the computing system usually, yeah, again, under a minute, it suddenly results appear on your screen. So how are you going to work your, your way through that amount of data? And um, we're also heading towards an sort of like a mail-in service where you literally just send your sample and it can be up to several hundreds in an hour that get screened. How do you do that? And um, so f from that point of view, we would really want a system um, that helps us. And um, that's how I got into the, uh, yeah, into the whole AI procedure because I asked the question and I started to look into it. Um, what do we need? Uh, resources? Why is like anybody else, more computers, faster computers would be nice. The money, where does it come from? Uh, some funders support that, others don't. Uh, yeah, so in, in the MX community, again, it's more towards drug design that gets well supported or general medical um, research, but not necessarily software development or maintenance or yeah, AI is still a bit of a newcomer. Um, so yeah, I don't know what else I did I have. Um, in terms of community, I think, I think if, you, if you work on a similar technique to acquire your data, perhaps there is a good basis of exchanging knowledge and teaming up, collaborate, because each and every one of us has a slightly different take on it, but on the other hand, we can combine that and support each other. Um, and then on the other hand, from when you've decided what you want to do with machine learning, perhaps then take that as a starting point and look in the other communities who does a similar approach, and maybe you can exchange across the communities there. And um, yeah, I don't know. Thank you very much, Melanie.
Hi. Okay. Joel, well, okay, most you of you have just five minutes maximum. Starting okay. now. So most of you uh, have heard from me already. I'm Joel Saltz, uh, chair of biomedical informatics at Stony Brook. So it was interesting that when uh, Tony invited me to this, I saw the photon and neutron, and I get, I I I envision the photon stuff. I have to admit, I don't have too, too much to do with 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 neutrons. Is me being much broader than facilities, which it may or may not have to be, but certainly the world is full of sensor data. And I guess I tend to interpret this as spatial sensor data. So in that respect, medical imagery is certainly uh, um, along those lines, uh, as is satellite, drone, uh, you know, whatever sort of aerial uh, imagery. So there, there are a bunch of data sources. And I was, was struck by the overlap in, in the excellent talks I've heard. So, so what are some of the key kind of eigen, eigenvectors associated with, with this? So, 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 so one is compressive sensing or the deep learning version. That seems to be something that most groups need. We, we need the issue of how you actually go about using deep learning to be much more intelligent in how you acquire data. A lot of great work on that. Uh, and I see in, in the context of most of this, one specific thought is whether we can come up with open source tools that are developed by groups that abstract away the details of the application uh, and essentially focus on uh, a, you know, a relatively modest number of common elements, uh, spatial, uh, spatial classification, analysis of uh, photons and neutrons fun fundamentally. Uh, computer in the loop steering of devices. This came up a couple of times in talks about beam lines. I think this is going to be actually very important and for those in the computer science community who used to have been funded by uh, uh, NSF in the States, uh, Frederica Dorema had had her uh, dynamic data-driven application systems efforts for years and years. And I think it's really coming to fruition, given an unmanageable amount of data, why look where the data isn't, or why look where you don't want to do. One way of doing that is simply passively, you know, have to turn your sensors on and off. But another would be to steer microscopes, beam lines, things like that. Um, validation, machine learning, and statistical methods. An obvious uh, low-hanging fruit is use of deep learning for UQ. However one defines that, I tend to find UQ uncertainty quantification gets defined different ways by different people. But bottom line, if you're, if you're classifying, segmenting, reconstructing, or whatever it is, uh, and other people are doing the same thing with algorithms that seem similar but are actually not necessarily the same, can we develop community methods of doing sanity check using uh, machine learning? Emulation of data sources with GANs, very interesting work, and I think that's obviously uh, very uh, important. Competitions, ground truth, sample data, another community sort of thing. Uh, funding, uh, of course, is one of the things that makes things happen, and this is a challenge in the sense that funding uh, is, is certainly generally nationally based, or EU, and also is often uh, based on uh, application silo, whereas a lot of what we're doing cross cuts. So um, you know, that, it would be good if that weren't true. What, whether that can be improved, I, 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 I don't know. Thank you very much, Joel. Sorry, and this is the member I forgot to put on the list, Bill. Yes, I'm, I'm a ghost. OK. Um, so kind of I'd like to reinforce those points. One of the things that you definitely get a very good return for your money on is anything to do with optimizing workflow in your facility because that's your most expensive resource. So that includes various things like providing tools for beam control, but also beam modeling that users can then use with their simulations and their experiment to model the whole process and see that everything's going to be good. If your beam sometimes goes off to the right and your user doesn't know that and is going to waste an hour of beam time kind of figuring that out, that's bad. So you can simulate that beforehand if, if you give the user a good simulation tool for the beam. Um, beam control we've mentioned. Um, the other side of things I wanted to talk about is just general machine learning. I think there's a little bit of a tendency here to take deep nets as kind of a black box and just sort of throw them at the problem. Um, don't forget that you're physicists, you have a lot of training, you have a lot of expertise. Um, and physics models are not just, you know, your three-day Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation. They're also the back of the envelope cal calculation that says, yeah, I should have a peak here and I should have a peak here. Don't know the exact position, don't know the exact shape. Um, 
but that kind of information can be very valuable if you want to parameterize a machine learning model. Forcing a deep net to learn it from very little data is not such a good, a good thing, probably. So think about your models. Think about how, far, how you can approximately simulate them without doing a, a big calculation. Try to put that into the input of the machine learning method. So y you work just up the road. Are you tempted to collaborate with this community? Never. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Da Daniel. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so yeah, I, I work at Slack. Um, I, I lead the machine learning efforts at the lab. Um, and as, as I mentioned yesterday, I also led this uh, BES workshop that on the same theme, similar to the one um, that was in at Co Copenhagen? Copenhagen. Copenhagen. Um, and in and, and that uh, round table, which was, which was more along the lines of the Copenhagen one, you know, kind of sitting around and work, working on boards and doing things the, the Silicon Valley way with post-its, um, we came up to talked about generally four themes. There was a lot of talk about data analysis, um, a lot of talk about online control, uh, in-the-loop steering, um, surrogate modeling, and then kind of data sets and data sharing generally. Uh, and I think that those, uh, although all four of those came up a lot uh, in the last couple of days, um, and so I would say those are, those are kind of, well, it, it would be unfair if I made, we made all, people do all that work and I didn't say those were the most important, important directions. Um, in terms of what we should actually be doing, I think the thing that comes up the most for me in terms of the value that we can have by working together is on workflows. Um, as we, we were just talking, you know, stu students come in and all they want to be doing is training deep networks, but 90% of the work is getting the data and cleaning it and putting it in the right format. Um, and then and at the moment, basically every time anyone comes into this, they end up doing all of that work again themselves. And I think the more that we can work together to collaborate on those workflows, um, the more we can make scaling up, uh, you know, making it easier for people to come online, easier for people to start getting work going, um, the better. The, uh, obviously, the, the closer in domain you are, the easier that is. Um, so I think we can do that at different levels. You know, at the ex for accelerators, we should all be working together on workflows. But then there's also some overlap between the accelerator side and the user side, and there's some overlap between photon science and um, and high energy physics. Um, so so that that would be my number one thing. I think the number two thing is sharing of data sets. Um, so if you, you know, once you're if you want to do this development, you need data sets to practice on. Um, for, for both the workflow and for the training. Um, the more that we can build these data sets, make them shareable, um, it's, it's a hard problem, especially in, in my community, but um, I think that that's extremely valuable. So those, those are the, the two things I think I would say in terms of collaboration, focus on the most. Um, that being said, I don't want to say it's not, not work to be done in, on the algorithm side, and for the algorithm side, I think UQ, whatever that means, uh, um, is, is Maybe maybe the most important because it's something that the Silicon Valley hasn't, you know, the industry hasn't focused on that much, um, and um, it's, it's very important for science, very important for doing control and the, the, the types of problems that we're interested in, um, and that's both um, U, UQ for ML and ML for UQ. So you know, using machine learning to understand the uncertainties of our scientific problems, um, for for properly handling um, uncertainties. We look going from raw data all the way to the to the prediction, and then also. Um, understanding the, the uncertainties in our ML models and when they're safe and when, when they can be trusted. So. Thank you very much. James, <laughs> over to you. So let's, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers. This has been a wonderful conference <clears throat> with lots of different people coming from a big community. So thank you to all of them. Let's just quickly do that if we can. <laughs> Second, some of the things I wanted to say <clears throat> have been touched upon, the importance of workflow, the importance of teams, uh, importance of building databases. I'd like to go into those in a bit more depth. So one thing to me is echoing what was said there, which is that there's a lot of math and physics in this audience, and it's important that it not all get lost in putting together machine learning algorithms or integrating these things, both because they stand as check and balances, also because they represent a long history standing historical way of understanding modeling, and finally because integrating them inside these algorithms will make a tremendous difference. Another topic for me actually is to really understand the difference between is one method really that much better than another method in the machine learning world? I mean, I've often said there's no algorithm for which you can't produce some set of data that doesn't make it look spectacular. And so I start to wonder when there's one machining 
machine learning algorithm that has, on this data set, been better than another one? Well, what actually does that mean when you start worrying about generalizing and things like this? So when I go through these topics, let me go through in a reverse order. What AI funding opportunities? I think every six months there's another giant one in the US, and I expect everywhere. Should we have a follow-up workshop? My answer is unequivocally yes. How should we take forward building community for the, uh, to forward these ideas? So this is a bit of a, it's a bit of a wild, the wild west right now. Everybody's saying, here's an experiment, I can do AI on this, look at what I get out of it. I don't know if we're quite there yet for all these integrated tools, but we have to be headed there. The challenge with workflow is, given that I'm not sure one algorithm is that much different than another algorithm, what does matter is the ease of getting to it, building the data, understanding what comes out, et cetera. So I've been saying for a long time that we really need a scientific image database. We see them in fields, we see them in biology, we haven't seen them so much in material science. We're starting to put them together, cameras doing that in the um, synchrotron community. So all these places we really need to build places where people can go and make comparisons. Finally, I really want to stress the issue of data triage. Detectors are faster and faster. Everything's coming out more and more. We don't and won't have enough supercomputers to keep up with everything. We really need to think about how do you build the algorithms? Some are machine learning, some are inverse problems, some are lots of other things to quickly decide this is worth doing, this is not worth doing because we're just gonna drown in all this stuff and since people are building bigger and bigger machines with bigger and bigger detectors, what are we going to do? And I think the real answer is the algorithms that sit at the moment of detection, if not even before, to tell you all sorts of things. Thank you very much, Snow. Okay, keep one for the panel, but I'd like now to open the discussion to the audience, and you're able to make suggestions, ask questions, uh, make statements. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this very interesting <coughs> conference, and uh, it's very interesting to know different kind of point of view. So I was writing down a bit few notes while I was listening, very interesting points. I will be uh, pretty nasty, and, but constructively, because I think that um, actually the question is, should we confederate together toward one objectives as large facilities to try to integrate all the aspect that has been mentioned so far? Yeah, sure, we can. Question is, where are the users in all of that? So we should actually engage highly the user in all this operation. It's not something that we can do just by ourselves. Can I just ask, how many of you would classify yourself as users in this audience? Okay, so we have a reasonable number. Yes. <laughs> so I think that the uh, uh, we need to uh, make it a bit more clear. Then uh, we need to involve not only the user, which actually heavily use the beam lines, which are in operation since the last 20 years or more. We need to involve also communities, which are interested really to use our facilities, but cannot do that because they don't have capability to interpret the data they get out of it. These are the community which actually will really prize our effort. So I think that will be a great point, that one. And second, uh, second is that Jonathan is very right, so I think that we uh, can, we should have a common format. I attend a lot of conferences actually where we have discussed about this point. So far, there is still not a great con convergence on that. But the thing is that, first of all, we should develop a common language between all the teams working on that because otherwise it will be very confusing how we, make, how we can identify the proper uh, data which are then going in this common format we are developing. So that's my two points. Thank you, Alexander. A any comments from the panel? Jamie. I'd like to respond to the users one. So one of the things that Canberra does that I like the most is it has workshops. We're on our fourth, we've just had our fourth tomography workshop. We've had them on XPCS, we've had them on machine learning, we've had them on tychography. And we bring users in and let them or make them or force them, you pick, listen to what the latest developers have to say, and then we switch it around. 
And the reason to do that is because the users sit there and provide a check and balance saying, okay, that's nice, but how do I use it? How do I actually get it? It doesn't do this. I don't want to learn all this stuff, that kind of thing. I think without them, you end up building an academic world for facilities versions of academics. And the truth is, it's the users that are the ones going home with the data and the ones that are writing the report saying, this facility was of no use, this facility is fantastic, et cetera. So I, I really think that users are the people that actually prove whether or not you're doing is worth something is worthwhile. Thanks very much. Um, so just because I had that comment about um, how much data we use in MX and how much we throw out uh, yesterday. 7%. 7%, <laughs> yes. Um, and that was rather positive. Um, so one of the, uh, or a couple of people asked me that afterwards. So one of the reasons is that, yes, it's just bad data because, in fact, some of our users don't know how to collect the data. And that's one of the reasons why we want to have more automation because the, the expertise has been dropping over the years. So it's more like people coming in now thinking the facility is just a push button exercise and not having to think about how to actually collect that data and what to do with it. Um, the other thing is a lot of, um, because of the, the, the data rates we have, a lot of people come with hundreds and hundreds of samples and they just put them on, they collect data from all of them and then cherry pick in the end what is their best data and the rest just fills the computer, fills the disks and just lies there and it's not been done, anything done with it, hence only 7%. Oh. And um, so <coughs> users, yes, is fine because lots of them have interesting projects, need help, need support, do cutting edge things and we want to support that. On the other hand, we have the an, a, a, almost the same amount of people who now s regard it as a push button um, service and they don't want to think about it. So it's a bit of a two-edged sword um, and yeah, so we need something in between. So just coming back to the, uh, the idea of the the non-expert user. Uh, so that's something that I think all facilities, or at least all people who are working in some kind of management of facilities, say this is this is the area we have to address. It's it's, it's easy to, uh, to to make a, a research infrastructure that can be used by experts, and there are plenty of experts, and of course they will deliver good science. Uh, but one has to cater for the non-expert user, uh, and I think this is this is the area where where there is some there is some leverage. Uh, for doing that because the only other way of doing that is having simply more staff in the facilities and of course that's that's prohibitive uh, for, for many reasons uh, but just for many reasons so this this is a, a good a good opportunity to make technology uh, work for the non-expert uh, as, as long as it can be proven to be beneficial and you're not telling people the wrong answer now the only other thing about about non-expert users or or people that don't, uh, or come into some new field, I mean, like me, I'm coming into uh, the machine learning field as a non-expert, is, is about standardization and, and data management. And that's one thing that hasn't necessarily been spoken of too much in, in this meeting, is how you deal with the data management aspect of, of this technology. So you have, obviously, a lot of data to, coming off the detectors, then you have a lot of training data, uh, and there's a lot of ancillary metadata which, uh, which one would like to keep. Uh, to assure oneself that the decision that the machine has made is the right one or the wrong one. Uh, and that's something that does actually need some thought because data management is a, is a, is a, is a, complex, is a complex thing in, in and of itself. Uh, I, think, I think Jackie Cole made a, a very interesting presentation uh, about just what you can use with data mining. And everyone has an open data policy these days, at least in Europe, uh, and the catalogues are open. And you would think, well, hopefully you should be able to point some kind of automated process at that and something good could happen. Uh, that's certainly the, the, the idea that comes uh, from the European Commission's view, the European Open Science Cloud, you know, citizen science, why not machine-led uh, citizen science? There's, a, there's an awful lot, though, that has to go into the, the nuts and bolts of data management at facilities uh, to make that work. Uh, and if I could say just one more thing uh, uh, along a similar line, if you create something that can make a decision very, very fast because you are taking data very, very fast, the rest of the pipeline has to be able to keep up with that. And that in itself is not particularly uh, been discussed in, 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 in this meeting, 
But if you want a real-time pipeline, the rest of the pipeline has to work at real time. And that's a challenge as well. Okay, so if you want to take another question. Um, yes, um, so towards community building, um, what about a Slack? I mean, would this be useful? And the other was... Um, you mean Slack as a, as a group? Right, um, for those who've used Slack, you know, this US company. Without a K, Slack without a K. Right. <laughs> um, and the other is um, sort of also sort of in this community spirit, you know, while there's a mention of um, open data in the EU, um, Open data without metadata is not terribly useful for the training of these algorithms, and some communities have been more open to this than others, as we've discussed. And is there any thought of how to um, encourage more people to have metadata associated with this data so that if it is actually released into the wild, it's useful for something? I'll, I'll take the second one, since I have the microphone anyway. Um, so. Uh, I think it's, as I've discussed with a number of people over the last couple of days, I think it's very critical that we have positive incentives for people to do this. Um, it's, it's very easy for you to tell users to say, you must collect your data, and if they don't want their data to be used, they can collect the data and put it online, it'll be completely useless. And I don't think that a stick is gonna work very well if the funding agency says, you must do this. That's not gonna have any effect unless there's also a carrot that forces the user, that, that, that encourages the user to do this in a constructive and useful way. Um, so we need things, in which is, it's a cultural change, at least in, in the, the FEL community, um, but you need some kind of incentive so that if you put your data set up and someone cites it, that you will, you know, so, someone uses it, that you will get a citation, that your funding agency will acknowledge that citation, that your university will acknowledge that citation when they're looking to give you a promotion. Um, and until we get all of the, that kind of positive encouragement, I don't think that it's gonna go anywhere. Um, and then the other side of that is you also have to make it easier for people to collect good data and collect good metadata because you're, you know, you, it's in the depth of the night and you have three hours left in your shift and you're not gonna get beam time for another year and the last thing you wanna be doing is typing up a lot of metadata. Um, so even if, it's, even if it, you have the best of intentions, you need, we need to give tools so that it's, it's easy for people to do that. Um, and then, yeah, for Slack for the K. We do, we do like Slack, although we hate the fact that no one knows what Slack without a K is anymore in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's always, always, oh, you work at Slack. Not that Slack. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Daniel. Okay. Uh, a couple of ones over here, yeah, so. Mark. Uh, <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to focus on the first point. Uh, what are the promising applications of AI and ML? I think what we've got here is uh, we've got the experts, today's experts in ML, AI. Uh, we've got new users who've presented some very interesting work, uh, trying out, seeing where they can go, as, as has been said, small groups. And I think there's a lot of future users here, people who are curious to know what we could possibly get into. So I'd just like to ha hear your opinions on, uh, without naming who these new users are who've been trying things out, have they been too ambitious? Have they been focusing on the right kind of problem? And therefore, where should the future users uh, try and invest their efforts? You know, is it, for example, is it, Simpler data, like we've seen small angle scattering data, X-ray absorption data. We've seen complex examples of phonons and so on in uh, single crystals. Uh, you know, where's the best place to go, in your opinion? Who wants to take that? I think there's a certain amount of groping around, which is a, important. I, I, I hesitate to say, Everybody should be going in this direction or everybody should be going that direction. There's lots of people trying lots of different things and they will sort and shake themselves out. Um, I mean, I, thinking of other fields, let's say solving PDEs or fluid mechanics. I mean, there was finite difference versus spectral versus finite element and things sort themselves out. Um, I, I think what we need to do is of course keep high standards in terms of what we expect these methods to do and produce, et cetera. But I don't worry so much about people trying things that may not ultimately pan out. Any, any other comments from the panel? Can I just respond to that? You know, this, this workshop is, you know, we're bringing people together so we can learn from each other. Uh, and in a learning experience, you want to minimize the groping around in the dark and, and get to the, you know, a useful result. Uh, more efficiently, I absolutely agree, you know, we're not in a linear process, you can't uh, target things like that. 
Uh, but, but there has been a lot of exploratory work already, and we've seen a lot of it here, and I just wonder what you draw from that. You know, what, what simple guidelines would you give people uh, new to the field? Would you say, you know, go for the simpler data first? Is that, is that going to be more, more rewarding? Uh, because, you know, we're going to have to invest effort and show some return on investment, and, and we, so we, we want to be able to demonstrate that. So can, can I ask Bill and, and Joel, who haven't said something? So I guess I already addressed that initially. Um, I, th I think that, yes, you need to grope around, but groping around in this context means try some simple models, think about how to use the physics knowledge and integrate it into the models, and maybe also try some deep learning um, and see what works best. And if people do that a little bit, then quickly you get an idea of what is working and what's not working. And so... so, so that, that exploration is, is critical to the process. Sorry. Very quickly, mention something that PNNL did an interesting thing where they had a, um, in, before you could get money to do any machine learning, you had to, before you could even put in your proposal, you had to put your data set on a server with a metric. And so maybe rather than saying, you know, something just, just the, making sure that you have a good training set, whatever you're going to work on, you have a well defined good training set first, maybe is the most important thing. That's interesting. I didn't know about that. Yeah, yeah Joel. No, that's 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 a good idea. Well, well again, I, th I mean, who could who could be who could be against exploration? And obviously, since uh, the number of actual uh, AI deep learning people ten years ago uh, self-described, out it might be five hundred, might be a thousand. Now we probably have like half a million. I mean, so there's a lot of born again deep learning people, <laughs> and uh, uh, so so we're really all you know. I mean, and and I. A lot of people have used machine learning, but generally a very limited set of methods for specific reasons. So now we have this explosion. One of the things that I think is very important, uh, which is what we're doing now, is really cross-community uh, exploration. I mean, I, I actually, before I came here, didn't know that this community was using the same, more or less at least, the, the same sorts of methods that we were. I mean, it would, if you'd ask me, are they, I'd say, well, maybe they are. I mean, it's, it's not shocking. But I do think that we can stir the pot the way we are actually right now in order to increase the sort of level of diffusion. It's sort of a reaction diffusion situation. And I think we do need to keep mixing uh, things so uh, we okay. diffuse ideas. I had, I had a te well, almost a sort of technical question that was touched on also by John and by Jamie. We have uh, bigger detectors, faster detectors, uh, so we have more raw data, and we're trying to treat this in a real-time pipeline. So it means treating uh, larger volumes of data, and also one idea that's always coming up is you should be compressing the data. Now we have funding even to work on data compression. My question to the panel is, would machine learning be applied, uh, could this be used to do data compression in a way which would be useful for synchrotron data? And I've asked Google, and I couldn't find the answer, so maybe you have it. Jamie. Yeah. I think very, very much. But it's important to realize that there are two questions in real-time analysis. One is the triage question. Was my experiment a good idea? Is this looking really great? Was this a dumb thing to do? Is my detector off? Is my sample in the wrong place? I think that machine learning for that kind of cre uh, compression is crucial. You often don't have time to solve full sets of equations, et cetera. So that is absolutely important. The other question, which is, can you do more than triage? Can you sort of say, this looks significant, I really want to work more, can I steer the experiment? Also, yes. Those are the things we're combining in that use of Gaussian processes and surrogate surfaces and optimization to do the steering. And we're embedding now machine learning into it to sort of quickly help us pick a next experiment to do. I, I heard the pithy statement from one of your colleagues. I Peter Dennis, I don't know if he came up with it, but to save information, not data, uh, which I think is just a, that doesn't tell you how to do it, but it's a nice way of thinking about the problem. Any comments on compression? Okay, so we take another one. Sorry, that's the best we can do. I have a relatively low level question about uh, organizing the community. So I, I guess we'll be talking about 
when we organize the next workshop or school. But what about uh, local communities? I, I, I'm interested to know what works. I mean, when you are in center, if you want to develop machine learning techniques, what's the critical size of a development team that you need? And do you need uh, exchanges, for example, with a, uh, coupling with an applied mathematics department? I mean, it's a very low level question, but to organize things locally, it's important. About building community and, and, and what type? Uh, Joel, you yeah, seem no. to have huge teams. Well, so local communities are an interesting hold, hold the microphone up. An interesting challenge, and I've had a number of uh, offline conversations. So, so the and this has come up some here uh, as well. So the so the issue is that if you have senior people who think deep thoughts or less deep thoughts and you know fly around and give nice chats you know i mean some you know most of us program some but you know we're sort of mostly speaking for myself at least not really the the sort of backbone of the coding effort uh in 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 a group and then if you've got grad students the grad students want to get theses and uh don't necessarily want to do kind of the the dirty work if they can avoid it uh, as, as Jamie points out, if you've got programmers, uh, programmers are often not really that ideally suited to grabbing onto the latest thing and understanding kind of the big picture. So the composition of teams, uh, I find, and I think that this is probably pretty common, uh, you know, a challenge. Maybe the labs do better uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, relatively few people who, I mean, there are a few people who work really hard at actually nailing down the pipelines. Research faculty and academic institutions uh, can do a great job on that. That's a wonderful position. And I, and I actually have an amazing uh, collaborator who's a research faculty, uh, Toss and Kirk, who's worked with me on these things for years. But they're really, really hard to find. And I think that um, some notion as to how we can build really good career paths to encourage people to actually want to build things is, is important. Any other comments? Hmm. Yeah, so I, I just want to object to that programmer's comment. Um, I think that in, in deep learning particularly, we've just seen huge influx of people. Um, and a lot of the people, they don't have formal training. Um, you know, they're often in third world countries and they've just done some web courses and then they start trying to do machine learning competitions and often they do very well. Um, and the thing is that they're young and they're enthusiastic. Um, but the opposite side to that is that they don't have to maintain infrastructure. And when you say programmers, you probably mean programmers whose job is to maintain yes. existing infrastructure. So no, I'm not talking yeah. smart people who program. And they're obviously <laughs> amazing. I mean, most people program. I mean, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so one of the things that we did in camera, which is in some sense one of the most dangerous and controversial things, is I hired truly software engineer people to work on the teams next to applied mathematicians and beamline scientists. And it's interesting to watch, you know, the thing I might hack together, I'll show them my code or I'll do something and they'll just burst out almost laughing and say, okay, now let's really rethink how to do this. And there are tensions that get set up there. I think when people have the same objective, you can work through those things, but it's absolutely crucial to have all those people in the mix. Otherwise, you end up writing things that may be state-of-the-art but nobody can use. Or what I see more often is the worst direction, which is people constantly reprogramming in the latest Python environment or the latest all the rest, and the ideas have become stale. It, that continuum is crucial. So, um, I thought some answer. I've got time for two more questions. I need to go to this side of the table. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I would like to, to thank the organization and the member panel, the panel members and all the people that took the time to prepare all the presentation. It was a, a great time. And thanks also for the cute animals. Uh, so I have a question. I don't know if it was a coincidence, but uh, two of the United States facilities, they said that they were hiring people. And uh, I would like to know if it's kind of... Uh, uh, you are struggling face to all these Silicon Valley monsters that have all this uh, well, out of mind capacity to uh, recruit people and most talented people. Or uh, if, well, I think that it doesn't help to develop science. 
uh, but it's really a threat uh, for developing science or there are still people that believe in this kind of uh, science for peace ideals you, you get to these people yeah um, yeah that's a it's a since I was one of the people <laughs> um, we'll see since we're, we're trying to hire some more people now um, and we hear Jamie's perspective on it um, I, I think it's very difficult because you have to find some smart person who wants to live in Silicon Valley where one bedroom rents for you know thirty five hundred dollars a month and we're gonna pay them one third what they can make if they go to, to Google or Facebook um, and they have to really believe in the science um, and I think there are two paths or the, the couple paths one one is you say well you just come and do this for a year or two and you can live in your friends living room and have some fun and then then you'll get an even better job when you go to Silicon Valley so we kind of like the rental version um, we can get people who already went to Silicon Valley started their company stole it for hundred million dollars and they don't care about money anymore and then they come back and do science as their retirement um, or we find people who are, have a monk-like devotion to science and truth and peace um, and are willing to make that sacrifice. And um, we're trying to do all three. I think that that also gives us a little bit like who we want to go for. Do we want to go for um, really great computer scientists? Um, or do we want to go for really great physicists who are interested in learning the computer science? So sorry, really great computer scientists who want to learn the physics or, or the other way around. And I think... It's for that reason, it's maybe a little bit easier to get the physicists because they're less drawn to, to Silicon Valley where they won't be working on the types of problems. You know, a really great computer scientist can work on really interesting computer science problems at Google, but a really great physicist is not going to work on as interesting a problem. Even if they, you can't do science at Google, but you're not going to work on maybe as cutting edge a problem. Um, so I don't know. I think, I think we're, we're targeting all of those people, and, and we'll see. Yeah, Jamie, yeah. the other lab in Silicon Valley. <laughs> so um, we haven't had trouble. Hiring. And I think the reason is um, once you get a critical mass of people, people want to join that team and they find it very exciting. Um, of course, these, these people have to be managed well. They have to be given enough freedom to go think about something that they weren't hired to do and some fraction of their time. Um, we have people that interview in Silicon Valley and say, I know exactly what I'm going to do and where I'm going to fit and what I'm going to pay and get paid and I don't kind of want to do it. So it's echoing a bit of Daniel. You, you can't talk somebody into taking one of these jobs just for the cash, but there are clear benefits and priorities, and we have not had trouble getting them, at least at camera, et cetera. That is, is remarkable in Silicon Valley. So we have time for one more question. Uh, I'm just going to go back there. I'll come back to you. We'll do two questions. <laughs> I'm giving up. I'm trying to finish more or less on time try to be brief. Many thanks for this workshop and for the great discussion. What I'm wondering and what I would like the panel to give us some feedback is how, how have you found communities adopting these new technologies and these new ideas within their own domain? Um, when I'm hearing people saying triage data, I know very well that a lot of users are attached to the data emotionally and they would not like to triage anything. Likewise, you know, getting to convince users that the AI may actually be able to decide the next step for their experiment is going to be something that they're going to have a lot of problems with. They know how to do experiments. They've been doing them for years. So, so, so facilities can invest a lot of money in developing these technologies, making them available to users. What advice do you have in helping facilities onboard these users with these technologies? I'll say very, very quickly on that. So Yana, who runs the data reduction pipeline for LCLS, puts it well, which says, it's not, you don't have a question of keep all the data or don't keep all the data. You can either randomly throw away some of your data, which means you operate the facility at lower repetition rate, or you can think about which data you want to keep. So that, that's your choice. It's randomly throw away data or think about which data, not keep the data or don't keep the data. So when faced with that question, maybe they have a different response. terms of how people reacted so I started with machine learning about five years ago and when I proposed that I was just simply laughed at and uh, now the same people who laughed at me five years ago walk up to their postdocs and PhD students and said you've got to learn machine learning so um, that's for how it's evolved over five years um, in terms of yeah community why didn't I find you? Because five years ago, I was looking for someone who knew about machine learning. 
Yes, last question. Uh, thanks very much. I've got a question regarding the bias. It's been raised already a couple of times. The workshop is called Artificial Intelligence, but most of the talks I Could you put the microphone closer? The, work the workshop is called Artificial in Intelligence, but most of the talks are about machine learning, and a vast majority of this are about 2D convolutional neural nets. Mm -hmm. is, it about, is it because the data is very much suited for 2D convolutional nets, or, or something else? And should we encourage development of other directions? Mm -hmm. Can I just say something? Uh, I mean, the reason I use AI is because it's the only thing politicians understand, all right? <laughs> actually, mo an AI covers an enormous space of which machine learning is a piece, and that actually deep neural nets were the things that made a breakthrough in 2012. So there's been a step change caused by neural nets. So I, I think you shouldn't worry about the distinction, but let Jamie say something. Oh, I wasn't. <laughs> I, I wasn't. <laughs> Can I end it all the way down? But I, I, but I like to see Um, sorry, I've completely blanked on the it, question. It was, a, it was about AI. As a oh, person. sorry. Yes, yes. I was just going to remark that you know, there's this this kind of saying in in, in um, the community oh. that AI is what you don't know how to do. Machine learning is kind of what you do know how to do. So, when you say AI, that means you know, well, we're promising we don't know how to do it. And when you say machine learning, that's kind of dull to the people who like to fund AI. Yeah. So, so yeah, I echo uh, actually what, what, what Tony said. There is, um, it's a, AI has a big Gardner hype curve. It's actually gone through it once before. And you know, clearly, uh, uh, deep neural nets, convolutional neural nets, uh, um, GANs and these related technologies have been tremendously enabling it's really only, in some sense, happenstance that it's called AI. I mean, a couple of a number of the talks uh, have gone into the relationship uh, between compressive sensing and standard numerical algorithms and these networks. So, in some sense, particularly with this community and, frankly, in my community as well, it's really a extension and generalization of existing methods rather than some, you know, magical uh, thing that's going to talk to you. But, but it is true in your field that deep learning made a transformative effect on what oh, you could do. Oh, absolutely transformative. And, and, and it's a pretty conservative community. I mean, that, that this, that this um, cooperative group where taking any action requires deep contemplation of at least 17 years, that they're, that they're actually uh, sort of jumping, you know, are actually doing this in a very active sense really does speak a lot to it. Okay, so I have one slide to finish with. Um, and this is my ex-colleague at Microsoft Research, Jim Gray, uh, and he worked with what's in the US, the National Library of Medicine, where they publish not only the abstract of the paper, but if you want to get your grant renewed, they actually have a sanction, so it's a stick, and now they get everybody depositing the full text of their paper in PubMed Central. Furthermore, because the National Library of Medicine have a budget of about $300 million a year, they actually can link that to the data, and they can go from database to database, back to the paper, back to the database. And that was the sort of vision that Jim Gray had uh, for what we need to do. We, of course, don't have $300 million a year to go and do that, but I do think we've heard from the, the panel about the importance of, of, of data, metadata, uh, standards for this and I think we need to do something about that but this was Jim's vision you go from the paper to add your data you can add it to other people's data because it's well defined you can actually go and do new science and publish new papers and he felt this was important to increase scientific information velocity and increase productivity and you see in the facilities we're going to have problems because we're generating too much data do we triage it and so on Lots of issues for us to think about, and uh, actually that's the sort of vision I think we should try and get towards, that we can actually increase science and productivity, actually get better science, more science, out of all the data being taken at these facilities. So uh, can we thank the panel for their comments? <laughs> and then I'd like... Oh, you're going to take that one. Okay. Rudolf, over you go. So before uh, you're heading out uh, and for the last lunch, 
First of all, I would really like to thank all the speakers who made this workshop a fantastic opportunity to get an overview of where we stand in terms of machine learning or artificial intelligence. It was fantastic. I was, I mean, really stunned by the quality of the presentation. So please thank all the presenters and presenters. <laughs> Then I would, of course, also thank the organizing committee, Paolo, Mark, and, uh, of course, Miguel from the ILL, Andy, and, uh, ESRF, Tony, SDFC, foremost, of course, and, uh, Anne Francoise and Brigitte for the outstanding and, uh, organization. And, uh, I think you all appreciated the catering and, uh, that made us uh, survive. And, uh, of course, it was a long workshop, and I think and, uh, only for that you would like to come back maybe for the next one. Now, I heard some very positive con comments about wine and cheese in Grenoble and, uh, uh, on that occasion. So please and, uh, thank the organizing committee for all the work they've put into this. <laughs> and then last but not least, thank you for having been here for all the discussions we had, also during the breaks. And, uh, we had some really good contacts, and, uh, and I think we can... Rudolf, could, could we make a little diversion at this moment? Obvious, of course. <laughs> AI, but is, uh, this is the real stuff. Brigitte and Francois. So uh, thank, thank you, you again for uh, having participated in this uh, fantastic workshop. And, uh, I wish you all a safe trip back. And, uh, be careful, the weather conditions are sort of a bit difficult and, uh, and, uh, this afternoon. And, uh, at least here, down here, we don't notice, but uh, it may be not so positive outside. And, uh, have a safe trip back and, and uh, let's keep in contact. I think there will be follow-ups. We will try and contact all the presenters, see whether they agree that we put up to, uh, the recording on our website because there is some stuff I think which should be preserved in the terms also of data management and, uh, and, uh, because uh, and, uh, it has some lasting value to have these presentations. Some of them are really deep and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, useful to have you know, online. So thank you again and uh, uh, hope, let's hope we see again maybe in a year for the follow-up workshop. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, there is lunch. Bill, thanks very much. It was, uh, yeah, no, no. Okay. Thanks for coming. I'm sorry. I got you over with. That's okay. I was doing it in a hurry in the first session and I forgot that there was another involved.